Director of Probation and Parole. Welcome, ladies. Thank, Thank you. you. So let us start with the purpose of these. Good day and welcome to the Government Information Services panel discussion on two very important bills which will be discussed in the House of Assembly on October 30, 2018. Now the two bills are the Child Justice Bill and the Child Care Protection and Adoption Bill. And to discuss this we have three guests in studio. We have Miss, Mrs. Elizabeth Lewis, Director of the Family, sorry Mrs. Elizabeth Lewis, Director of Social Services, Beverly Ann Poyot, Director of Family Court, and Yolanda Jules Louis, Director of Probation and Parole. Welcome, ladies. Thank you. So let us start with the purpose of these two bills and a little bit on its background. Can you speak on that? Well, yeah. Um, this morning, we are here to discuss the two bills, as you indicated, and St. Lucia takes a step closer to improving our legal landscape. Um, with respect to how we engage and deal with children and families. And so we will hear a little more, a lot more, in fact, about what is referred to as the Child Justice Bill, which speaks mainly to children who come in conflict with the law, and the Child Care Protection and Adoption Bill, which speaks to how we deal with children who are um, victims of abuse and who need support from, from the state. Okay, uh, for now I just want to speak briefly on the, the Child Justice Bill. The, the bill mentions the age of criminal responsibility. Mm -hmm. Could any of you explain what that is? Okay. Age of criminal responsibility in St. Lucia currently is 12 years old. It is the minimum age at which a child can be held responsible for committing infringing penal law in St. Lucia. In other words, a child at age 12 can be arrested and charged for committing an offense. Mm -hmm. So what, uh, what, are, what is the, after the bill is passed, the age will be 12? Or is it currently 12? It is currently 12 and it will be 12 after the bill is passed. It will remain 12. So what are the sort of implications that you foresee with the, the passing of this bill or with the, the age of criminal responsibility being 12? The age of criminal responsibility, what really it does is to allow, <clears throat> allow us within the juvenile justice system to really look at whether that child has an understanding of what it is that they did. And that is what the age of criminal, criminal responsibility really speaks to. As we know, all children go through their development in a progressive manner, but some quicker than others. And so that will allow us um, to be able to determine whether that child understands what it is they have done and whether they can, they can actually be held responsible for the action which they have committed. An action, as we are speaking, something that would be against you know, the laws of the state. And there has, has there been uh, any sort of psychological research to determine that, that at that particular age, uh, a minor would f understand their responsibility? Yes, there are studies that have been done, and if we just look at the general um, child, the way, the manner in which a child develops, general developmental stages of children, mm -hmm. it has been determined that that is a reasonable age at which a child should have a basic understanding of right from wrong, um, good from bad, things that a child is normally taught, you know, from a very early age. And what sort of, does St. Lucia have any secure facilities that can house children who have committed offenses at that age? Yes, we currently have the Boys Training Center, as everybody knows, mm -hmm. that is our detention center for boys um, who have come into conflict with the law. For us in St. Lucia, it's the only institution that we have, um, and Boys Training Center also houses our children, some of our children who are in need of care and protection. The facility has been separated in two mm -hmm. so that they are not um, completely together 
so you have that facility. It is our hope that we will get a facility for girls. Currently, we don't have a secure for residential facility for girls. However, having said that, we, when we look at the Child Justice Bill, one of the things that it speaks to is diversion. And I guess we will discuss that a little bit more. So diversion really is going to allow us to be able to assist children, to be able to put programs in place where children don't necessarily have to be housed, don't have to be in detention centers in order for any kind of rehabilitation to take place. So what, what exactly does diversion mean? If they're, if they're not housed in the detention centers, so does that mm -hmm. mean they will be taken care of in another facility or in a, a sort of transit home or, a, or at their own homes by their parents? Okay, basically, diversion is going to speak to a procedure that the courts will use for children in conflict with the law to send them to programs that will help <coughs> with their rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. So these programs may be, may be day programs, hence they will not stay in any residential facility for that matter. Mm. Just to add a bit, um, and let me just take us back a bit in terms of a brief um, background and history. Um, one of the things we've recognized, or it was recognized back then, that's St. Lucia and other OECS countries signed on to a number of conventions and treaties. And of course, we have to live up to certain standards if you are going to sign on to them. So these bills actually came out of, these two bills that we are discussing this morning, they are coming out of another group of five or other bills um, that were put on the table as areas that we needed to improve on um, as we deal and with children and families. Um, so there's going to be a lot of changes. Now I heard you ask um, about the issue of the age. Mm -hmm. um, age becomes a big issue, not just in respect of the criminal responsibility, but age is going to become an issue in respect of the changes of who is a child. So this, in those bills, a child um, will be considered somebody under the age of 18. Now that is a major shift for us. That is going to be a major shift for us. Because as it stands now, for us at the family court and at the probation and at human services, a child is considered somebody under the age of 16. Mm -hmm. So with the passage of those two bills in particular, we will see age of a child now changing. And so we are going to have a wider spread, a wider net um, by which we can provide support for, for children. And so um, the whole issue of diversion is for us to ensure that we provide enough services and support to young people, that we don't just take them and place them in institutions, mm -hmm. um, that when we pick them up on offenses, minor, minor offenses in particular, then we can provide them with a way out that they don't necessarily have to get themselves um, within the juvenile system, the justice system, and of course be labeled as criminals as you know we do. And so um, the whole idea of the bills is to now ensure that our young people, our children, our families are given greater support within the justice system. In terms of, as you mentioned, that the, the punishable age is, is, well, children are considered children under 16. Um, what does that mean in terms of punishment of a minor who has committed a crime? Is, are, will they be held to the same standards as an adult committing a crime? Um, like anything else, uh, if a young person commits a crime, we will, under this child justice bill, there will be a particular way of dealing with and managing with this child. Um, of course, it doesn't mean that children will not be punished, as we say. You know, we always want mm -hmm. to know that people get punished for doing something mm -hmm. wrong. But certainly, we are going to look at several other issues surrounding the child as to why the child got themselves involved with such, you know, in such mm -hmm. a behavior. And so it is not just going to be, you have stolen from X, and so now we are taking you to court, and now you are sending you to, to bodily, or, you mm -hmm. know, or to BTC, to Boys Training Center, or somewhere. But now we are going to look at your history. We are going to look at your background. We're going to try and understand what made you do this. And of course, once it is deemed that this child, there is hope, you know, that we can work with this child, then we are going to provide services for this child under the whole idea of diversion. Diversion is a major aspect, as you would have heard from Ms. Um, Poyot and Mrs. Mrs. Louis, mm -hmm. under the Child Justice Bill, because it really now is going to cause us as practitioners to work much closer with 
other entities within the society <laughs> because it doesn't mean because that we see diversion, that diversion has to be done at the family court or um, at probation and parole or at human services. Now we have to engage the entire society to see how we can all now wrap ourselves around this particular child or group of children to ensure that their lives improve um, and so they don't remain out there um, and they end up, you know, as criminals as we want to make all mm -hmm. them. So what would be the role of the police officer in terms of apprehension or detention of a minor offender? Hmm. Let me let Mrs. Louis, <laughs> because this is really the role okay. of probation. Mm -hmm. um, actually, under the child justice bill, the police are the first responders to apprehending a child. Once the police apprehends the child, they need to inform the probation department mm -hmm. so that this word is this word that a child has been apprehended mm -hmm. is actually communicated to a probation officer mm -hmm. who will then, in all respects, <coughs> begin to handle the matter from then. Mm -hmm. okay? So the police actually are the ones who are going to apprehend and they have to communicate to probation. And what is the process when it Within goes a specific time period. Mm -hmm. What is the process when it goes to the pr um, probation okay. officer? Child's matter or case is reported to probation mm -hmm. or to probation officer. The probation officer will engage with respect to carrying out assessments, risk assessment, mental health screening tools, getting parents and all significant others involved, mm -hmm. and the child, after all these assessments and reports are going to be submitted to the magistrate who will be sitting along with two other social workers on what is called an inquiry. Uh, what, okay. what happens in the event that a police officer is, is unsure of the minor's age? Okay. This is verified having hold of a birth certificate for mm -hmm. the child. That's one of the first things that has to be done. Mm -hmm. The age of the child, um, you spoke of uncertainty of the age of the child, in as much as the police officer who makes the apprehension reports to probation, the child's parent also has to be called in. <coughs> Excuse me. The child's parent or guardian also has to be called in. So in that manner, all of the biographical details and all of that would be part of the preliminary assessments that Mrs. Lee was speaking about, together with the mental health screening and all of these kinds of things. Mrs. Lee also made mention of the initial inquiry. It is at the initial inquiry that our first level of diversion can come in because at that inquiry, we would already have a background of the child. And it's very important for us to note here, that is one of the major differences <coughs> that we are going to have. <coughs> Excuse me. That is one of the major differences that we are going to have in our system. Generally, when a child is apprehended now and brought to court, we know very little about the child. Mm -hmm. It is only right before sentencing that the probation officer is required to do a pre-sentence report. With this new system coming into place, we're going to have information about the child prior to going to court. So we already know who it is we're dealing with. And it's important because we are now looking at dealing with children who come into, the con who come into conflict with the law in a very individualized um, process. It is no longer one size fits all. And so knowing about the child going into the initial inquiry, whether the child takes, the re takes responsibility for their actions, all of these are going to determine whether diversion can happen at that point in time. And that is what we call pre-trial diversion. Uh, what are the sort of the rights that a child would, or a minor would have during, well, while being detained in police custody? Rights of the child. The child has the right to um, have an attorney that again is another major shift in the in the manner in which we deal with children mm -hmm. so attorneys will be made um, available for children who, who require it the child also has the right to have their parents and guardians present the child has a right to speak okay and to say whether they understand or don't understand something so these are just some of the basic things that the child is going to be part of the process and not the process happening around the child 
Is there any circumstance where a minor could be sent to a place like Bodley Correctional Facility? Um, based on our current system, because we do not have any additional facilities, there is a unit at Bodley that has been designated for age 16 to 18. And in the absence of any other institution, that area at Bodley can still be used to house our children age 16 to 18. But as I said, it is away from the general population and it is designated specifically for that category. With the passage of the new legislation, all of the processes and procedures will also be extended to them because they do fall into that category as children now. Okay, we are actually due for our first break right now. So this is the Government Information Services panel discussion on the Child Justice Bill and the Adoption Bill. We'll be back in a moment. I'm so fed up with my 14-year-old child. She's driving me crazy. I just don't know what to do. All that child need is some good licks to wake up. Alice, ignore the counseling pansies given. Government employees have free access to professional counseling services under the Employee Assistance Program known as EAP. EAP? EAP? What's that? Uh, not me that telling people my business. Listen to me, Alice. I was struggling with my child. I made an appointment to see an EAP counselor, and I was very satisfied with the service that I received. And you know what? Up to a day like today, my information remains confidential. Cox, how come nobody in the office knew anything about your counseling? Ah, that's because EAP counselors, they work on the strict clauses of confidentiality. I know you know what confidential means. Eh, uh -uh. EAP providing professional counseling services? How much is it? Girl, the counseling is free. Free for you, free for your child. And you know what? Your information remains confidential. Call the EAP unit at the Ministry of the Public Service. Telephone number 468-2269 for more information. EAP works. Let it work for you. Welcome back. So before the break, we were speaking about the bodily detention facility. Uh, could you speak on what circumstances would lead to a child being sent to the site facility, how specifically for minors? Um, the main reason would be because of age. Mm -hmm. um, and the second, main, the second reason would probably be because of the nature of the offense. Uh, offenses uh, come on, a different, on different levels. And based on the level of offense, mm -hmm. the law speaks to what can and cannot be done at a particular level. Say, for example, if a child is accused of committing murder, that would be one of the instances where the child would be mm -hmm. sent to the secure facility at Bodley. And uh, could you speak on when the Division of Human Services actually becomes involved in criminal matters regarding juvenile offenders? Right. So um, the Division of Human Services really does not. That, that when it comes to children engaging in um, offenses, that these are children who would be dealt with through probation and parole under the Child Justice Bill. Division of Human Services, however, comes in where we break, talk about the Child Care Protection and Adoption Bill. Currently, we have one act that is the Children and Young Persons Act that would guide us, provide guidance to us and the courts for both dealing with juveniles and children who require care and protection. And so with the separation now, which we are going to see with the passage of those two, with those two bills, Human Services now becomes the agency will have legal responsibility to ensure protection and providing support to children and families to improve their social situation. Um, and so this is where, where we'll fit in. Um, when this bill, the Child Care Protection and Adoption Bill is passed, Human Services will be named in this bill as having that legal responsibility, as I mentioned earlier. And so um, one of the things that is going to be different for us, apart from now having a wider span of children to deal with, now we are moving from just focusing on children under 16, mm -hmm. now to focusing on children under 
advocating um, is that we will also have the responsibility for adoption. Currently, adoption is being done at the AG's office, the Attorney General's office, mm -hmm. they are responsible. But this new bill is um, going to move forward in that there's going to be an adoption committee, um, working very closely with human services for adoption because we recognize that adoption is still a child protection issue mm -hmm. and it's not just facing a child if anybody anyhow, anywhere, any, um, anywhere, sorry. Um, so it is, it's going to change how we do things at human services really and truly. We are going to see a difference in the number of the type and number of orders that the court can provide to ensure protection of children. We are going to see changes in um, how we do our own processing at human services. Um, there's going to be issues on, on time limits for investigations. That is going to be very critical as we go forward in ensuring that we respond in a timely fashion um, to issues of children, you know, anything that comes in um, for needing child protection. And of course, another major one for us is going to be the issue of supervision. Um, so, whereas a child may commit ex um, presenting challenging behaviors, uh, currently um, probation and parole would engage them. It would, have, it, now, it would now become the responsibility of human services and we would have the option, if after working with the family, um, that we are not seeing that kind of synergy, that kind of work with the family and the children, mm -hmm. then we can go before the court and ask for a supervision order to ensure that things happen in the manner as was planned with the hope that it's going to improve the child's situation. Okay. I want to get to the, uh, the adoption bill in a second, but uh, before I move on to that, I want to, to explain the, the issue of confidentiality with regard to the child justice bill uh, and its, uh, its importance regarding the identity of alleged child offenders. Could, you, could any of you speak on that? Um, like anything else, um, I'll start off and let Mrs. Ms. Louis take on. Um, confidentiality is always very important when you're dealing with children and families. I mean, for us, even on the adoption, I mean, there's a penalty. There's going to be a penalty for anybody who gives out any information regarding um, adoption. And likewise with, with, um, with, with young people, um, that when they come in contact with the law, what we certainly do not want is for the information to be out there in the public. Um, we have to respect that notwithstanding that they are children, they have rights too. And one of those rights is to ensure some level of protection and, and support for them. And this is where the whole issue of confidentiality is coming, how we are going to engage and process them. Um, it's, it's, it's going to be very, very critical in their own um, development and how they turn out under the system. Mm -hmm. I don't know if Mrs. Louis wants to add a little more. Um, yes, just basically to state in the initial inquiry process mm -hmm. to maintain confidentiality, it will only be persons who are important to the process mm -hmm. of what is happening to the child. For example, significant others, no other person will be allowed in the initial inquiry process. Okay. I want to stretch that a little further and speak to the whole issue of a record, a police record, as far as a child is concerned. When mm -hmm. we speak of confidentiality, when we look at um, persons who come into conflict with the law, we know that there's a police record that follows them. With our children, there's going to be no record that follows them. Mm -hmm. So if anything happens before the age of 18, yes, it is logged, it is catalogued, it is kept in confidence, but af after the age of 18, there is no criminal record that carries over with that child. So in the event that, um, I'm thinking of a scenario, a scenario here where a, a minor offender gets to the age of maybe 20, 21, and they're looking for a, they're applying for a job or a scholarship or something of that nature. They, their criminal past, their criminal record from the under the age of 18, it will not, they will not have to disclose that? It will not affect them in any way? It should not dis affect them unless, let me just clarify, unless it is one of the level three offenses, which are the higher category mm -hmm. of offenses. And but mm -hmm, such ahead. as, as I said, uh, men mentioned earlier, for murder and things like mm -hmm. manslaughter. Mm -hmm. But if we're talking about things like stealing, petty mm -hmm. theft and so on, that is not going to be on record. Okay. okay, the other thing I can share on that is this child 
having attained the age past 18, mm -hmm. can now apply for their records to be expunged. Mm. Okay? Okay. Now I want to speak about the, the Child Care Protection and Adoption Bill. Uh, with the Child Care Bill, will this give children more of a say in their own welfare? Mm -hmm. And what, what exactly does it mean that they will have more of a say with, um, with regards to their own welfare? Um, currently, and I, I, I'm going to speak from a wider societal issue, that we seem to think that children should not have a mm -hmm. say in things that concern them. Mm. Part of what this bill is going to do is that when we sit to discuss plans on behalf of a child, once a child is of an age to understand, then the child is allowed to make an input. Um, because if Let us pray. In the name of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, by whom alone kings reign and princes decree justice, and from whom alone cometh all counsel, wisdom, and understanding, we, thine unworthy servants, here gathered together in thy name, do most humbly beseech thee to send down thy heavenly wisdom from above, to direct and guide us in all our consultations, and grant that we, having thy fear always before our eyes, and laying aside all private interests, prejudice, and partial affections, the result of all our counsels may be to the glory of thy blessed name, the maintenance of true and justice, the safety, honor, and happiness of the Queen, the public will, peace and tranquility of St. Lucia, and the uniting and knitting together of the hearts of all persons and estates within the same, in true Christian love and charity one towards another, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, greet us all, now and forevermore. Amen. Good morning, honorable members. I beg to announce that since the last sitting of Parliament, His Excellency has been pleased to ascend to the Immigration Amendment Bill. I have received an excuse from the honorable member for Mikudnov and Minister for Education, Innovation, Gender Relations, and Sustainable Development, who is attending to matters related to the death of one of, of a young lady who is a member of staff in her office. Honorable members, I wish to take this opportunity to extend sincere condolences to the family and friends of both and Shah who died on September 6, 2018. The circumstances of his death is a, is a much unfortunate one, and we wish his family all the strength and God guidance for it all. 
we have to keep the name of Bofamja somehow in the minds of the authorities on the other side of the ocean. I also wish to note with sadness the passing of former member of Parliament, Gregor Mason, who passed away on September 29, 2018. Mr. Mason was a former parliamentarian who represented the constituency of Grosley in opposition from 1974 to 1979. He then served as Parliamentary Secretary in the Ministry of Agriculture, Land, Fisheries and Cooperatives from July 1979 to May 1981, and then as Minister for Agriculture, Land, Fisheries and Cooperatives from May 1981 to May of 1982. I also wish to congratulate Ms. Julian Alfred on the achievement of a silver medal in the women's 100 meter at the Youth Olympics, which was held in Buenos Aires, Argentina, only earlier this month. We wish her all the best as she continues to journey in her athletic. St. Lucia celebrated Creole Heritage Month, or is still celebrating Creole Heritage Month, and I do hope all of you uh, didn't have fet or we are, uh, and I, I see some of you still reeling from the en enjoyment of Sandy Just Gone. Every year, honorable members, the world continues to fight breast cancer by raising awareness and funding during October, Breast Cancer Awareness Month. This year, Faces of Cancer St. Lucia has once again invited businesses to be part of their October Workplace Breast Cancer Campaign as they continue to make striving cancer awareness around St. Lucia. The Parliament Office has therefore been heartened to participate in Think Pink Fridays and small change can make a big impact in an effort to collect donations for this worthy cause. All the monies collected will go towards the, the work of Faces of Cancer St. Lucia as they continue to lessen the cancer burden in St. Lucia. A jar has been placed downstairs in the reception area for donations. We are asking all members to contribute to this endeavor. Statement by ministers. Minister in the minister, minister with the responsibility for youth development and sports. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Good morning, members. Mr. Speaker, I would like to make a very short statement on the attainment of a silver medal at the Youth Olympic Games. As a nation, Mr. Speaker, whose simple beauty is known throughout the accounts of history as the Helen of the West, we continue to triumph to great heights with, just to name a few, more Nobel laureates per capita than any other place. A globally beloved Darren Summit, the majestic Golden Heights of Laverne Spencer, Young Kimani Melius, Johnson Charles, and the unforgettable Nick Eli Box, just to name a few. Mr. Speaker, as Minister for Youth Development and Sports, permit me to salute on behalf of the government and people of St. Lucia, the accomplishment of one of our finest track athletes, Ms. Julian Alfred. Ms. Alfred is currently the Sportswoman of the Year. Mr. Speaker, Julian's determination, energy, passion, and most importantly, her faith, and most importantly, her faith, makes a clear statement that speaks to our youth, reminding them 
that excellence is a way of life, developed through character, persistence, and unyielding practice. <coughs> Miss Alfred's silver medal performance is the first ever Youth Olympic medal for St. Lucia. Mr. Speaker, Julian Silver Medal is a great reason for national pride and delight. Her run of 11.23 seconds is what did it for us. It is our hope and with our support that she will continue to rise and be an inspiration and continue to be an inspiration to us all. Mr. Speaker, as a government, we remain focused on providing assistance and support to allow our youth to excel in sports. For our proactive policies, infrastructure, and programs. Mr. Speaker, we are confident that as athletes like Ms. Julian Alfred and others grow and develop, they will continue to display in competition and off the field the good thermal and electrical conduction properties that is characteristic of pure gold. Through your remarkable efforts, Ms. Alfred, you have radiated positive light in our nation by making the world see that our flag is more than just cloth and ink, that it embodies zeal, will, passion, and shared determination of our people from a tiny spot in a small corner of the Caribbean to rise to great heights of majestic proportions. Mr. Speaker, we may be small in size, but we stand tall, proud and powerful that we are able to take on anyone and finish high on the podium of medals. Mr. Speaker, the triumph of Julian, and Laverne in particular, serves to urge and remind us that once we are serious about putting our hearts, body, mind, and soul into even the smallest acts, success will be attained. Such is the St. Lucian spirit and, spirit and personality. May it never fade, become dull, or that we lose the essence of that desire and passion to attain. May the Lord continue to protect and bless our people. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Papers to be laid, Honorable Prime Minister and Minister for Finance, Economic Growth, Job Creation and External Affairs. Mr. Speaker, I beg to lay before the House papers in my name. Statutory Instrument Number 62 of 2018, Special Development Areas, Amendment Schedule 1 Order. Statutory Instrument Number 64 of 2018, Excise Tax Amendment of Schedule 1, Number 11, Order. Statutory Instrument Number 65 of 2018, Aliens License Exemption BDSL Limited, Order. Statutory Instrument Number 66 of 2018, Legal Aid Regulations. Statutory Instrument Number 68 of 2018, Excise Tax Amendment of Schedule 1, Number 12, Order. Statutory Instrument Number 73 of 2018, Excise Tax Amendment of Schedule 1, Number 13, Order. Statutory Instrument Number 81 of 2018, St. Lucia National Housing Corporation, Do Carmel of U4, Vesting Order. Statutory Instrument Number 82 of 2018, the St. Lucia National Housing Corporation, La Ressouce View Fort Vesting Order. Statutory Instrument Number 84 of 2018, Excise Tax Amendment of Schedule 1, Number 14 Order. Statutory Instrument Number 85 of 2018, St. Lucia National Housing Corporation, La Ressouce View Fort Number 2 Vesting Order. Statutory Instrument Number 86 of 2018, Customs Service Charge Amendment of Schedule Order, and National Insurance Corporation Annual Report 2017. 
Honorable Minister in the Office of the Prime Minister with responsibility for tourism, information, and broadcasting. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I would like to lay the following papers in my name. Uh, Mr. Speaker, Statutory Instrument Number 69 of 2018, Tourism Stimulus and Investment Act. S. That should be Sam Fai Gardens Limited, order. Statutory Instrument Number 70 of 2018, Tourism Stimulus and Investment Act, Point Center Apartments Limited, order. Statutory Instrument Number 71 of 2018, Tourism Incentives, Banana Country Limited, order. Statutory Instrument Number 77, Tourism Incentive Act, Great Stay Guest House, order. Statutory Instrument Number 78 of 2018, Tourism Stimulus and Investment, Hammock Suites, Inc., order. Statutory Instrument Number 79 of 2018, Tourism Incentives Act, Cutting Edge Tech Incorporated, order. Statutory Instrument Number 80 of 2018, Tourism Incentives, IAM Jet Center, St. Lucia Limited, order. Honorable Minister in the Office of the Prime Minister with responsibility for Commerce, Industry, Investment, Enterprise, Development, and Consumer Affairs. Mr. Speaker, I beg to lay the following papers standing in my name. Statutory Instrument Number 63 of 2018, Price Control Amendment Number 11, Order. Statutory Instrument Number 67 of 2018, Price Control Amendment Number 12, Order. Statutory Instrument Number 72 of 2018, Price Control Amendment Number 13, Order. Statutory Instrument Number 74 of 2018, Standards Compulsory Standards Number 1, Order. Statutory Instrument Number 75 of 2018, Standards Compulsory Standards Number 2, Order. Statutory Instrument Number 76 of 2018, Standards Compulsory Standards Amendment Number 1, Order. Statutory Instrument Number 83 of 2018, Price Control Amendment Number 14, Order. For report April 2017 to March 2018. Thank you. Motions, Honorable Prime Minister. My apologies. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move the following motion standing in my name. Be it resolved that Parliament authorizes the Minister of Finance uh, to amend the loan agreement and to borrow from the Caribbean Development Bank an amount not exceeding U.S. $11,228,000, consisting of a special funds resource portion in the amount of U.S. $4,065,000, an ordinary capital resource portion in the amount of U.S. $2,163,000, and an Agence Française de Développement Credit Facility portion in the amount of $5 million U.S. In this resolution refer referred to as the amending loan agreement for the purpose of financing the 8th Water Denry North Water Supply Redevelopment Project. Mr. Speaker, the loan agreement for the Denry Water Supply Project Phase 2 was signed on October 27, 2017 between the Government of St. Lucia and the Caribbean Development Bank in the amount of $11,228,000 U.S. dollars. On the 9th of April 2018, the Caribbean Development Bank approved a variation to the loan agreement. The variation to the loan agreement was required to allow for the replacement of the United Nations Office for Project Services, UNOPS, with a supervision consultant. The revised loan amount remains at $11,228,000, and it will comprise of $2,163,000 from CDB's Ordinary Capital Resources, OCR, $4,065,000 from the bank's special fund, resources on the SFR and 5 million United States dollars uh, from the Agence Française de Développement 
under a credit facility agreement and a grant of US $110,000. The terms are concessional and are the most cost effective that may be negotiated at this time. The amount withdrawn from the AFD loan account shall be repaid in 48 equal and consecutive quarterly installments on each due date commencing on the first date due after the five years following the date of the amending loan agreement or on such later date due as the CDB may specify in writing. The borrower shall pay an interest rate of 4.5% per annum, variable, on the amount of the OCR proportion withdrawn and outstanding from time to time. The interest shall be payable on a quarterly basis. The borrower of the executing agency may open and maintain a designated account at a commercial financial institution in the project country. The terms and the conditions for the operation of the designated account are outlined in the amending loan agreement. All the other provisions of the loan agreement shall remain in force, in full force and effect. The expected outcome and the activities of the project remain the same. The project will provide a safe, reliable and climate resilient supply of portable water to residents and businesses in Denry North. In order to achieve this, the project will comprise the following. The project preparation to include preliminary designs, environmental and social impact assessment, climate vulnerability and assessment for the redevelopment of the Denry North water supply system. Land acquisition, the project com comprises the acquisition of 0.8 hectare acres. Infrastructure works, raw water intake on the Mabuya River, complete with pumping station. Water treatment plant with a treated water pump station providing a minimum of 1.4 million imperial gallons per day. Raw water transmission pipeline between the intake and treatment plant. Water transmission pipeline between the treatment plant, the junction of Derinere River, Main Road and Miku Highway. Water transmission pipeline from Miku Highway to the existing Montparnasse pumping station. A pumping station in Derinere Rivere. Standby generator at the raw water intake pumping station. 150 millimeter diameter transmission pipeline from the Miku Highway connecting the treated, the treated water pumping station to existing Tomazo st storage tank. 250 millimeter diameter transmission pipeline between the treated water pump station and a new storage tank in Denry North. 250 millimeter diameter distribution pipeline between Denry North storage tank and the Miku Highway. Distribution system improvements with the Mon Panache. Distribution system improvements with La Rousseau's community, including new distribution pipelines. Replacement of the Derrier River storage tank with a new 378 cubic meter tank. New transmission main and series of pump stations to service Olion community. SCADA system to control the operations and the redevelopment system. The project will also comprise a project management engineering services and a communications and awareness plan. The project is expected to be implemented over a period of 24 months. Speaker, as you know, this is a continuation of the first phase of the project, and we're very much looking forward to be able to complete this project as quickly as possible in order to allow the community of Denry North to obtain the water that they so richly deserve and all solutions deserve. Honourable Members, the question is that Parliament authorizes the Minister for Finance to amend the loan agreement and to borrow from the Caribbean Development Bank an amount not exceeding U.S. $11,228,000, consisting of special funds reserves, resources portion in the amount of U.S. $4,065,000, an ordinary capital resources portion in the amount of $2,163,000, and an Agence Francaise de Development Development Credit Facility portion in the amount of US five million. In this resolution referred to as the amending loan agreement for the purpose of financing the Eighth Water Denry North Water Supply Redevelopment Project. Be it further resolved that the ordinary capital resources portion of the amending loan agreement 
A is repayable in 48 equal or approximately equal and consecutive quarterly installments on each due date of the first day of January, the first day of April, the first day of July, and the first day of October of each year, commencing on the first due date after the expiration of five years following the date of the amending loan agreement or on such later due date as the Caribbean Development Bank specifies in writing. B is payable at an interest rate of 4.5% per annum or at such order rate that the Caribbean Development Bank specifies to take effect after the first due date after the 31st day of March of the 40th day of September in a year withdrawn and outstanding on the amount of the ordinary capital resources portion and C is subject to a commitment charge at a rate of 1% per annum payable quarterly on the amount of the ordinary capital resources portion on withdrawn and which accrues from the 60th day following the date of the amending loan agreement. Honorable Member for Dan Renoff. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Good morning, colleagues. Mr. Speaker, I rise in support of the motion as presented by the Honorable Prime Minister. Um, this motion is of particular interest to myself as the parliamentary rep for Denry North, who also happens to be a resident of the constituency. Um, it is not unheard of for parliamentary representatives to come to the parliament and express the concerns and the interests of their constituents, um, albeit from a distance. Um, knowing that they do not reside in the constituencies that they represent. But for me, Mr. Speaker, this is a moment that I ought to be very proud of. It is an intervention that will impact me personally, but more importantly, impact all the communities of Denry North. Um, but with your indulgence, Mr. Speaker, I want to take the opportunity to add my personal congratulations to the many persons who have publicly expressed their gratitude to Gillian Alfred, um, given what she has done for our country. Ms. Alfred won the silver medal at the Youth Olympics in the 100 meters. And what it has done, Mr. Speaker, is that it has once again reminded us of this rich repository of sporting talent that St. Lucia is. And that if we put proper programs and structures in place, have the proper support mechanisms for athletes, we can achieve what persons believe rightfully belong in their minds to the more developed countries. And so I was not surprised um, that Gillian was able to win that medal at the Youth Olympics. Um, I remember when she was at the Leon Hess Comprehensive School, um, Mr. Speaker, she got a scholarship opportunity to go to Jamaica, finish her secondary school, program in Jamaica at the same time um, working on her athletic talent. And through the National Watches Authority, we were able to provide support to Gillian. We were able to provide the sum of, and it might not be much in the context of what is being spent in St. Lucia today, but we were able, yes, the minister's account, we were able to provide Gillian with approximately 20,000 Jamaican dollars to basically take care of her needs on a daily basis in Jamaica. And today, I watch the news, and I, I watch the footage, and I am extremely proud of the intervention that we made for Gillian to get her to where she is today. Now, we are not taking credit for anything. What I'm saying, Mr. Speaker, and the point I'm trying to underscore here, is that if we have the requisite support structures in place for these athletes, we can achieve a lot more than we have as a country in the global sporting realm. And I want to echo those sentiments in Creole. Mevle di that me ka souhaité Julien Alfred tout ça qui bon et mevle di félicitations pour ça il j'a fait bay pays nous ko un youth olympics qui était tapé chen en en Argentina. Pli bon et moi ça il gain en médaille bay bay cette ici. And Mr. Speaker, the minister in his statement earlier on said it, and it is something that I concur with. I think she is the brightest um, athletic talent that we have at the moment. And it would be a travesty on our part as a country, not just the government, but all of us as a country, 
if Jillian is not given the support that she needs at this critical juncture of her career to ensure that three, four years down the road, we can have our first senior medal at the Olympics. Jillian Alfred is a resource that must be managed very carefully. She must get all the support that she needs. And as I said, I believe if those mechanisms are put in place, not only will she develop to become the world-class athlete that she's on her way to becoming, but it will happen in a time period that is much faster than we can believe. Mr. Speaker, back to the motion. I want to state that the tabling of this motion for the Denry North Water Redevelopment Project is welcome news, as I said, for myself and for my constituents in Denry North and the Mabuya Valley, who have waited for decades, decades, to have this water problem resolved once and for all. The fact that phase two is only now being discussed in the Parliament of St. Lucia today, Mr. Speaker, should serve as a reminder, and you must take into consideration that when the project was first conceived, it was supposed to have been completed in the year 2015. But the fact that we are here in 2018, talking about phase two, is a timely reminder of the exceedingly long gestation period that some government projects um, can, can take. And so, with all the bureaucracy and the hiccups, sometimes due to no fault of ours, the people are the ones who suffer and they're the ones who have to endure. So today, I am extremely pleased that, that the government has come to the parliament to seek the authority and approval of the parliament to borrow from the Caribbean Development Bank um, roughly $22 million for the completion of phase two. In a previous, at a previous seated in this honorable house, the member for Babono, who has land responsibility for water resources, said to me across the table, Mr. Speaker, that among other things, I was busy taking pictures at the treatment plant at the completion of phase one, but that my government had put nothing in place um, to ensure that there was funding for phase two. That is not entirely correct. And I was relieved this morning when I heard the Prime Minister himself say that what we are doing here this morning is basically seeking approval to amend an existing agreement with the Caribbean Development Bank. And I know for a fact that the general manager of WASCO did inform the PS in agriculture by way of writing that the Caribbean Development Bank at a board meeting in May of 2015 prior to the general elections of 2016, that at a board meeting, the CDB had approved the loan agreement for phase two of the Denry North Water Redevelopment process, Project. So here this morning, Mr. Speaker, we are basically making an alteration to an agreement that was already in existence. Mr. Speaker, when I took to the campaign trail in 2011, and I offered myself to the people of Denry North. I campaigned heavily on the situation that existed as it related to water resources in the constituency. The problem, as I said earlier on, had existed for decades. And for many, many years, the people of the valley had to consume water that was of a substandard quality. And in cases where the supply was rich in households and certain communities, um, Mr. Speaker, the quality was very much compromised. So we had, we had um, a, double, a double jeopardy case, so to speak. Insufficiency in terms of supply and poor quality. Mr. Speaker, in the late 80s, or late 70s and 80s, Bilazia wreaked havoc in the Denry North community. And I can recall as a child, a primary school child, I can remember very vividly personnel from PAO, the Ministry of Health, and other stakeholder agencies coming into the constituencies of the into the constituency of Denry North and handing us toddlers containers that are kind of similar to what we, we, we package butter in at, at, at the supermarket. And those were being handed to us in the community. And they were, we were being encouraged that instead of using the toilets, we could use those containers as, as substitutes. And that was their way of collecting data to get to the bottom of the Bilazia problem 
that was wreaking havoc in the constituency. As a result of that, we had a very high infant mortality rate in the Mabuya Valley. Babies and children were dying because of the ingestion of contaminated water. Lo and behold, the PAHO, the Ministry of Health, and the other agencies were able to get to the bottom of this, and we were able to solve that particular problem. But Mr. Speaker, the problem manifested itself in a different form in the 1980s into the 1990s. So whereas there was an improvement in quality, we had a situation where in that rush to cultivate banana and to get from the green gold oil, residents resorted to deforestation on a very large scale. The forest, sections of the forest was destroyed, the watershed was compromised, and that resulted in a significant decline in, in um, the volume of water that was available for, for consumption. So, Mr. Speaker, the forest was destroyed. People started growing bananas on very large scales and even small, small scales on the, on the hillside, compromising the, 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 the water quality and supply. Also, the use of agrochemicals were being Traces of agrochemicals were being found in the water downstream. And I recall reading a report from WASCO that was done in collaboration with what at the time we knew as C, but I think they're known as CAFA today. The report, Madam Speaker, had nothing favorable to say about the quality of water that was at the disposal of the people of Denry North. And so I campaigned on the premise that a central Labour Party government would address the water situation in Denry North. That particular cry, which I echoed on behalf of my people, found favor with the then Prime Minister and member for Viewfort South. He gave me the assurance that we were going to do something about the Denry water redevelopment, um, the water situation in Denry North. The member for Labri, who was the external minister in the Central Labour Party government, went globe trotting, trying to get resources to cause the government to tackle the Denry North water situation once and for all. Mam Palama Pulabui, qui c'était ministre qui tenait responsabilité pour les affaires étrangères en dernier gouvernement Leba. Il allait tout partout en la terre, qu'à try joindre l'argent pour aider gouvernement adressé problème glo en Valley Mabuya et puis Denry North. Premier côté moi quoi y aller c'était Morocco pour try parler et puis gouvernement Morocco pour qui assistance sur ça bail. Ça parti bon nous ça nous devlé. It was on the margins of an OAS meeting in Guatemala in 2012 that the member for library in his capacity at the time as external affairs minister engaged his foreign affairs counterpart from Mexico and it was there that an agreement was brokered and Mexico agreed to fund the Denry North Water Redevelopment Project. So there was a meeting in Guatemala, a meeting in OAS in 2012 Mam parlement pour la boui qui c'était ministre qui tenait responsabilité pour affaires étrangères. C'est là il parlait et puis un ministre Mexico et Mexico prend décision et puis mam parlement pour la boui that you take time fait l'argent available pour um ranger situation glo en Denry North. Et me ca changer um Mr Speaker there were a lot of meetings that preceded the actual commencement of the project. I remember there was a cooperation agreement signing between then Prime Minister and member for Viewfort South, Dr. Anthony, and the then Mexican ambassador, the then Mexican ambassador, Ambassador Moreno. And at the cooperation agreement, which was well attended by stakeholders from Mesoamerican Bank in, in Latin America, um, UNOPS, the United Nations Office of Project Services, WASCO, community-based organizations, all of them were represented at that particular meeting. And it was then, Mr. Speaker, I started seeing once and for all that progress was being made. At the end of the day, Mr. Speaker, Mexico agreed that they were going to provide approximately 5 million US dollars 
to tackle the problem of the Denry North Water Redevelopment Project. Mais 5 millions la Amérique qui Mexico te permet pas te ni assez pour adresser tous ces problèmes là. Et bien bon est en gouvernement nous we, la ça pas te ni assez. Et c'est pour raison ça qui fait gouvernement Liba mettez en application devant Caribbean Development Bank et pour demander plus la hein, pour faire ça en anglais, nous avons créé phase 2 of the project. Et comme vous plus bon, Mr. Speaker, the, um, the, the, the loan agreement with the CDB has been adjusted slightly, and I don't think it is unusual for governments to do so. You come in, you find a particular agreement has been in existence, and of course it is in your purview to, to make adjustments and alterations as you see fit. But what is most important and most critical this morning is the fact that the Denry North Water Redevelopment Project Phase 2 will be coming on stream. And I think the biggest beneficiaries of such an initiative will be the people of the Mabuya Valley and Denry North. So, Mr. Speaker, whereas we are here for the loan, and just to mention some of the attempts that have been made to ameliorate that particular problem over the years. Um, I remember, Mr. Speaker, there was a proposed damming of the Tonnes River in the 1980s and 90s with French funding. That did not happen. Mr. Speaker, the Global Environment Fund, known as GEF, through an initiative known as IWCAM, Integrated Watershed and Coastal Management Area in small island developing states, they too had a presence in the Mabuya Valley and in Denry North. Um, get at addressing the water situation in the valley. They, their focus was on the harvesting of rainwater. And they too knew that that particular initiative would not have solved the problem in its entirety. But as a stopgap measure, it was supposed to help ameliorate the situation, particularly um, when things were critical. The Central Social Development Fund, the SSDF, they attempted to intervene as well by making water storage tanks available to the residents of the community. Mr. Speaker, a private non-profit company of Osbert Duvain, registered in 2006, known as the MDI, the Mabuya Development Institute, proposed a solution to the problem. They were saying at the time, that they could have gotten $12 million in the form of grant funding from the European Union. A proposal, to the best of my recollection, was prepared, and the word on the ground at the time is that the architect of that proposal um, had serious issues with the government of the day, and as a result, that went nowhere. That was one of the many attempts at ameliorating the water problem in Denry North. And finally, Mr. Speaker, this partnership that I mentioned between the government of Mexico and the government of St. Lucia bore fruit. And that is why today we have phase one of the Denry North Water Redevelopment Project having been completed. And I will do in much the same way that I did at the opening ceremony for that commissioned phase one. I will register my gratitude and my thanks to all the major stakeholders who would have contributed to make phase one um, realizable. But Mr. Speaker, to give you a chronological um, sequence of, of how this happened, as I said, in May, not in May, but in 2001, 11, sorry, I campaigned on the delivery of fresh drinking water to the people of Denry North. In 2012, we met with the government of Mexico through the External Affairs Minister, and we were given the nod that we would have gotten assistance in that regard. In 2013, I remember leading a technical team from UNOP, SWASCO, and the Mexican government on a constituency field trip, which at the time, the Mexicans referred to as a Fisher Technica. And all it means is that they're doing a technical feasibility to see if what we were requesting of them um, could have happened. Today, I'm happy to report that not only was it able to happen, but phase one has actually happened. In 2014, the Mexico's, well, Mexico's foreign minister, His Excellency Jose Antonio Cabrera, reaffirmed his government's commitment to the project on a visit to St. Lucia 
in February of 2014. And although his main reason for being in St. Lucia at the time was to promote St. Lucia's attendance or to ask for St. Lucia's attendance at the ACS summit, which was being hosted by the Mexican government. But he also profited the opportunity to reassure us at a meeting at Belgium Hotel that they were on board with that particular project. In 2015, the cooperation agreement was signed and the project funds were released in 2015. Contracts were designed, build, signed in 2016. In 2017, civil works started and phase two, phase one, sorry, was commissioned in the year 2018. Mr. Speaker, as we speak now, the people of Tamazo, the people of Founier, the people of Lower Montparnasse, Lower Dibonnet, the people of Richfort, in particular New Village and La Bellevue, are benefiting and are enjoying some of the best treated water in the OECS as a result of the completion of Phase 1. Okay. But Phase 1 has its limitations. And so communities such as Denier Riviere, Despin, Olion, New Jack, Montego Bay, Sedini, La Rivière, Gardet, Tigadet, La Jet, Austin Hill, Belmont, all of these communities today, Mr. Speaker, have to continue to rely on the Denier Riviere intake, which has a number of issues in terms of the quality of water that we get from that particular intake and, and the unreliability of, of the supply that comes from those areas. People have been agitating for phase two. And as a responsible parliamentary representative, Mr. Speaker, I can tell you that many persons have come to my office asking that we stage protest and demonstration because when the project was first conceived, the idea that was being tossed around at the time, and it was also almost an agreement with constituents that we would have wiped out everybody's outstanding bills. And once the fresh supply had gotten to their homes, people would start paying for the quote unquote new water as they call it. But I had to tell them, Mr. Speaker, that <laughs> yes, they probably wanted to make a fresh start. But I have to tell them, Mr. Speaker, and I mean that sincerely as a responsible parliamentary rep, that in order to get the, the, the in order to get the better quality water, paying the bills for the old water, so to speak, is something that they have to do to ensure that we move speedily to getting um, the, the, the clean water, as they call it. So today, Mr. Speaker, this will be good news for the people of Denier Riviere. The people of Olion will be equally elated, as will be the people at Tilaresus, Lapel, and the other communities that stand to benefit from the completion of phase two. Mr. Speaker, as the Prime Minister said in his presentation, water storage tanks will be constructed in selected areas. And I know that the land acquisition process started um, last year. I know some of the persons will be impacted in that regard. Um, I know up until last week that they had cooperated fully with the powers that be to ensure that there were no major impediments um, as it relates to that particular project. Booster stations or pumping stations, as we call them, will be set up in strategic locations, particularly to serve the more elevated communities. Um, there are some existing booster stations or pumping stations that do not that have outlived their usefulness. There's one at Larissus, Mr. Speaker, in the vicinity of the health center. That will be upgraded. There's a new booster pumping station to be constructed in Denier Riviere, which the Prime Minister mentioned earlier on. Nous avons mis un pump Denier Riviere, pour qu'il y ait un nom miraculeux métro. Pump glossa à si posé, vous avez glomouté Austin Hill, et pour ces gens qui sont en l'air là. Parce que plus il y a l'année, Mr. Speaker, ces gens qui sont pour lever deux vingt jours. Et Jean, ma famille, ne pourra travailler presque en chiffre système. Que si c'est toi aller dormir bonheur, il y a des pour lever du vent jour pour les gloires venir, puis ça pas être des bonnes gloires. Et situation ça, c'est un qui est capable de faire en Olion, Montpenache, Dibonnet, Belmont, Gardet, et c'est place ça que la gloire parti à arriver. So, c'est pas ça, c'est pas nous ca welcome qu'on dit en anglais. Gloire qui est à pour le moment en phase 1. La Niglo qui s'est arrivée dernière rivière. Mais on est pour engager, on est pour engager dans un processus qui a créé Valvin. 
pour nous fermer à l'autre côté, pour à l'autre côté joindre. Et ça y est, on dit, on dit ça, on a créé les hydraulic capacities of the lines are insufficient. Qu'on se tire à pas go assez pour mener gloire à aller à ces places à qui vous aime. Mais on dit ça, nous, that même si on fait mes valves avec nous, ça n'a pas créé un bobaï, parce que ça a créé une situation où c'est pas toute commune à Valia qui a créé un glo même là. So, je suis bien content, M. le Speaker, et comme je l'ai commencé, je suis venu ici à parler de problème de la constituante. Je ne parle pas parler parce que le monde dit que je veux dire ça, parce que c'est ça le monde qui Tout ça, le monde constituante qui a expérimenté, et puis le problème de la c'est ça qui a expérimenté pour tout le monde. Là, l'appli qui est le bon matin, et après 10 minutes, l'appli qui est si vous n'avez pas fait la loi, ça nous a joué en cité de nous qui a fait nous croire que nous avons juste fini faire un job juste à ma main. Gloire sale, sale, sale. Mais comme je dis, je suis content de voir l'année prochaine, car il y a un problème qui est un problème qui nous pas fait encore. Je suis changé de manière à travailler avec le ministre des Affaires de Jeunesse, comme le ministre de Youth Development and Sports. Il y a des gens qui viennent de travailler le bon matin. Ou quand même, il y a des gens qui Et là, on me pour qui raison vous avez comporté comme ça Vous avez dit que vous avez pas de bâle au glou pour le week-end. Et vous avez dit que ça peut être cher. Le week-end, vous avez un glou. Là, vous avez un panache qui vient. Là, vous avez un aïdan qui a resté en tête de Austin Hill en dernier rivière. Là, vous avez un tête de Tigoube qui peut être un glou pour l'année. Yes. Je ne parle pas de quelques mois, ou weeks, ou des jours sans eau, vous savez. Je parle de yes. There are children who attend secondary school who had never seen running water in their homes in certain pockets of the Mabuya Valley as recent as, as, as last year and earlier this year, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, we need to say thank you as a community. And I've been given that parliamentary responsibility to come here and exp express the collective gratitude of all the residents of my constituency for that particular initiative. I am particularly pleased with the fact that this Labour Party initiated project was allowed to go through. I must admit I was extremely nervous when there was a change of government, given what had happened in the earlier um, um, days of this current administration, where certain projects were, were being stopped. But I am extremely grateful that this project has been allowed to continue. And as I've said before in this honorable house, anything, n'importe by je donne une offre, hors gouvernement, qui c'est le parti qui a power, qui c'est flambeau qui a power, ça c'est bagay nous deserve. You know why? Because during the days of Green Gould, when millions of banana revenue was coming in this country, to build infrastructure in Rodney Bay and everywhere else in this country. It was the banana revenue that was responsible for that. And it was the people of the Nabuya Valley. We used to wake up at 4.30 in the morning and 5 o'clock in the morning, head into those farms to deflower and to harvest bananas, to cause them to go to Europe to sustain, to sustain a very healthy revenue stream for this country. So today, Mr. Speaker, we rightfully deserve what is coming our way. I think we deserve a lot more. But the Trinidadians have a thing saying, Mr. Speaker, it's an adage in Trinidad that ingratitude is worse than witchcraft. I do not want us to be accused of, of being in that, that, or for that particular expression to be ascribed to us. And so once again, on the collective behalf of all the good people of Denry North, I want to thank the government for bringing this motion to the parliament. And I look forward to work on phase two starting sooner than later and that at the completion of phase two the entire Mabuya Valley the Enrinoff constituency will be benefiting from some of the best treated water in the entire Caribbean. Thank you very much Mr. Speaker. Minister for Equity, Social Justice, Empowerment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
Honourable Members, and Mr. Speaker, just before I make my contribution on the resolution, let me just take a, a minute to express, officially express my condolences to the family, friends, and associates of the late Gregor Mason, my predecessor who once represented the constituency of Grosile, who recently passed. I extend my sincere condolences to his family. Uh, friends, the people of Grosile who, who loved him and whom he served, as well as the people of Swazel, the constituency from which he hailed. Mr. Speaker, I wish to add my voice in support of this resolution, if nothing else, as Minister responsible for social services. Now, very often when we speak of social services, health, education, community services come to mind. But when we think about it, among the amenities that are required in any community for the service of and comfort of citizens, we know that water is one of the fundamental basic needs that is very important to everyone and all. Now, Mrs. Mr. Speaker, when we think of water, we think of water as a necessity for drinking, cooking, for sanitation, in terms of hygiene and keeping our surroundings clean. We think of water also as a product that is necessary for economic growth and development. And so I will support and welcome any initiative that will provide to the people of St. Lucia that vital resource that is indispensable, that is required and necessary for very life. Mr. Speaker, if we look at the 17 Sustainable Development Goals that have been set out to be achieved by 2030, we would recognize that it was sufficiently important that water and sanitation be mentioned as goal number six. Goal number six says that we have to ensure access to water and sanitation. And to realize this, Mr. Speaker, projects such as this one must take place. And it is my fervent hope and dream that we will not set ourselves the goal of the United Nations and the international community of achieving that by 2030, but that we, we set ourselves a more aggressive agenda to ensure that each and every St. Lucian has access to portable water way before 2030. And so, in supporting this resolution, I am reminded of the situation as far as what obtains when we do not have portable water that is safe drinking water. And the member for Denry North has already alluded to some of the issues that obtained in the past, in the not too distant past. And we want to ensure that we do not regress back to those days when, as he indicated, in the very community that is being addressed right now, we had a situation with Bilazia. We do not want waterborne diseases to resurface in St. Lucia so that we have people of St. Lucia, especially children, dying of Bilazia, cholera, and other waterborne diseases. And so this effort here will go a long way not only in terms of providing comfort to the people in terms of alleviating that essential basic need, but it will go a long way in providing better health, better sanitation, hygiene, and of course, as I indicated earlier, opportunities for economic growth and development. We know that perhaps the, the, the supply of portable water can become accessible but not sustainable. And so in our effort to provide this, this facility, we must also remind our people of their responsibility. Their responsibility to ensure that they protect the environment and that they ensure that they do not put into their environment contaminants that will pollute the very water that they use. Because of course, we see figures such as about two million people dying each year out of the use of contaminated water worldwide. We want to know that this is not an occurrence in St. Lucia and that we do not contribute to those statistics. It is said that water scarcity affects about over, in fact, over 40% of people worldwide. 
We know that in St. Lucia, there is no shortage of water. Our issue here is ensuring that that water is portable, that is, it is safe for drinking and human consumption, and that it is sustainable. The amount of rain that we have experienced in the recent past tells us that with proper storage, proper treatment, and proper environmental practices, we should not have a problem as far as our supply and the standards of, of our supply is concerned. And so I want to urge our people, the government has its role to play, and we've heard that, yes, previous administrations have played their role. We, contrary to the rhetoric, are a government with a conscience and are a government with concern and regard for, for the people of St. Lucia. And it does not matter the source of the initiative once it is a worthwhile initiative that will benefit the people of St. Lucia. We will pursue it. We will support it. And so I just want to ask that the people themselves for whom these interventions are being made, the beneficiaries of those actions, that they too show regard for the amenities that are provided to them. Only recently I had to lament, and that was in the area of sports, I had to lament vandalism of public facilities. Now, if we have water storage facilities, water tanks, what have you, we have, I do not know if we're going to go the route of putting public standpipes or public facilities, we want to know that the people respect them, protect them, and maintain them because it is a service that is provided for them. Very often there is the attitude that Bagay Gouvernement, you can just date week to one man, quasi, and if you can realize it, say, call your mem, you can affect it. So, Mr. Speaker, I just want to appeal to residents to desist from vandalism of such important amenities. I want to appeal to residents who do not practice vandalism, but they raise their voices when they see others vandalizing what they consider to be public facilities, which are in, in effect and in fact their facilities. And so in support of this, Madam Speaker, I just uh, want to, to hope, express the hope that we, way before 2030, we would have not just the commissioning of this project, but there are a few other communities in St. Lucia where up to this day, I am embarrassed to say we still have not provided portable water to those communities and that we will continue in the effort to ensure that we eradicate that need, hopefully before 2021. Thank you very much. Honorable Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries, Physical Planning, Natural Resources, and Cooperatives. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I want to say good afternoon to all colleagues. Mr. Speaker, I rise to give support to this resolution like the member for the Renault said that the responsibility for this project falls under my leadership. So I'm sure members here would appreciate that I need to stand and give support and to express my appreciation to the Minister of Finance for agreeing to bring this resolution to the Parliament. I'm happy, Mr. Speaker, that the member for the North expressed satisfaction at, and, and giving recognition to this government for continuing this project. And like I said before, what are we, what we experiencing now as far as this project was an initiative start under the St. Lucia Labour Party in recent times, but I'll come to some negative experiences also. And he said he was a bit nervous, Mr. Speaker, when he saw and realized that was a, there was a change in government. 
was a bit nervous because he was under the impression, I, I'm assuming based on his own experiences, that we would not continue the project. But we have been blamed and we have been chastised for not continuing projects. And each time we have been chastised and blamed, we are showing them that that's not a government that behaves in that manner, Mr. Speaker. Because I'm sure the reason for his nervousness is based on his own experiences. And I can speak to a number of them under his leadership and his watch that never continued in Babono as when he was Minister of Youth and Sports. I'm sure he remember all this. But that's not the nature of this government, Mr. Speaker. We continue good things. Things that make sense and things that impact the people of this country. We do not victimize, according to them. We do not victimize people. But Mr. Speaker, I want to say that we are aware of the impact of a reliable supply of water. And I want to express my appreciation, Mr. Speaker, through you to the management of WASCO, the leadership of WASCO. Because when I was given the responsibility to provide leadership for WASCO, I did question my Prime Minister because we all know the challenges that WASCO was faced with. I say was. It's not a matter of planning programs. It's not a matter of coming with ideas as far as programs are concerned, Mr. Speaker. What's really important, what's really critical is the implementation of these programs. Is the implementation of the programs that you have planned. So whilst the member for Denny North will speak to um, is a, uh, an idea and a program started under them. He also said, Mr. Speaker, and he also mentioned of all the initiatives that was undertaken to try and relieve the situation in the Henry North. He mentioned them. And the last one he mentioned was Mr. Osbert Regis, Mr. Osbert Dover, sorry. <laughs> Where there was a certain government that was not in favor with Mr. Osbert Dover and that project never came through. And it's true. And you know why I'm happy, Mr. Speaker? I'm happy because, based on my own experiences working in the Mabia Valley, I was involved in trying to correct the situation in Mabia Valley. So I stand there as one who has a lot of experience, first and experience, in trying to solve that situation in Mabia Valley. So, Mr. Speaker, I'm saying that if the initiatives that were planned before and went on its way. And that said government, he never said who it was, did not see the reason to discontinue it, Mr. Speaker, we would not be here today discussing that project. It would have been a project implemented many years ago. And he knows that. So he should have told us which government that was not in favor with Mr. Osbert Dover, why the project never took place. But Mr. Speaker, I want to say that as a government, we have reviewed the project. And that's why we come in here to get the guarantee. We have reviewed the project. And we have made many changes to the project, Mr. Speaker. And I won't go through all that what was said because the Prime Minister and even him, Mr. Speaker, articulated as to what is it that we're going to accomplish as far as phase two is concerned. Because it makes no sense to have the treatment plant and you cannot distribute the water. And that is why we are here today, Mr. Speaker, getting the approvals, the legal instrument, so we can engage the contractor to continue phase two. Some of the changes we made, Mr. Speaker, was, and he spoke to it, the, the consultant of, during phase one. Mr. Speaker, when the management of WASCO reviewed and I talk about the new management, reviewed the terms and conditions as far as engaging that consultant. 
management told me that they believe that if they continue with that consultant, it will create some financial problems for them as far as phase two. And there was a need to re-advertise and to get some new consultants on board, Mr. Speaker. And when you look at the difference between what has been proposed by the consultant for phase one and the consultant that we engaged for phase two, we talk about over $1 million in consultancy fee for, phase, for, for that consultant for phase two compared to what we pay now, $500,000. So how it is, we have seen a big reduction, Mr. Speaker, as far as the consultant for phase two. Mr. Speaker, when you look at the whole aspect of the arrangement for phase one, as it pertains to the contractor, I said consultant and contractor, listen. We had one individual, local individual, being contracted to do all the work. And as a government, we have always said that we need as much as possible to engage as many people when it comes to infrastructure development. And the management of Wasco was informed of the policy decision of this government, and we said we have to revisit that arrangement with the contractor. And you should be happy, Mr. Speaker, because what we have done for phase two, instead of having one major contractor doing the works as far as laying the pipes, we have requested from Vensi, who is going to continue phase two, to engage more local contractors. And to me, Mr. Speaker, we can see the benefit of an initiative like this. And I remember when my, member, my, my colleague from um, Swazel Saltibas engaged in that type of approach, he was criticized. But Mr. Speaker, we have to understand that as a government, we need to expose our, our, our small contractors. And that is an opportunity to expose the small contractors in the valley. That's an opportunity to, to expose the small contractors in St. Lucia. So that is another major change we have made to the project moving forward, Mr. Speaker. Now, Mr. Speaker, I heard a member for the Henry North say that persons came to him and there was a commitment made as it pertains to the outstanding payments, the errors in water bills in the valley. And then he advised them to pay the bills because Wasco need the, water, the money to put on the infrastructure. And I say to myself, it looks like the member is not aware of what's happening in, in his constituency. Because Suka advised Moon to pay Lahan, qui en reste pour glow, qui pate bon. On the 8th of February 2017, Mr. Speaker, I advised the management of Wasco to engage the parliamentary representative to discuss that matter. February 2017, to, to engage him, sorry, October 2017, to engage him to discuss that matter as far as outstanding monies and outstanding arrears. All right? Unfortunately, Mr. Speaker, he never replied. He pajeme vie parler by Wasco pour 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 Wasco sa parler pi et pour pour Wasco. Mr. Speaker, I rise with a point of order. The honourable member is misleading the house by suggesting to the parliament and persons listening to this debate that. You, 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 the speaker. Yes. Honourable member for Denry now. Yes, Mr. Speaker. He is giving the impression yeah, that himself. Wasco wrote to me, himself. asking to meet to discuss outstanding bills. I have never had any invitation by Wasco, and the member is misleading the house, and he needs to desist from doing that. Honourable Minister, I surely believe that you understand the point being made by the honourable member. And then for you to so clarify. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I, I know you'll come there. Mr. Speaker, a letter from Wasco, Edmund Ritt is general manager, and I can read it. 
Dear Honorable Edwards, the Water and Sewage Company, Inc., Wasco, is preparing to officially take over the ownership and operation of the new water treatment facility in Denry North. In this regard, Wasco is proposing Wasco is proposing having a discussion with you as parliamentary representative of the above area to discuss the official official ceremony and aspect surrounding the commencement of charging the residents for the use of the water resource. I am therefore availing myself at any mutual convenience for such a discussion at the soonest. If, if, if you accept this invitation, I would be most appreciative if you would propose a venue, date, and time to facilitate this discourse. General Manager of WASCO, Mr. Edmund Riches, CC to Dosha James Calendar, Human Resource Manager, and Zilta George Leslie, Cus Customer Service Manager. Honorable Minister, Honorable Minister, um, I'm hoping you'll make this document. Sure, Mr. Speaker. Very well. Continue, sir. Okay. <laughs> so, I'm saying, Mr. Speaker, who lack advisement to pay? Who lack advisement to pay the people? Who was going to come? Et puis, on m'a dit pour venir discuter qui manière nous a engagé ce monde pour nous faire de l'eau. On va advise au coupé. Mais là, nous tenons ce moment, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I stand on a point of order and I will insist that I never received that letter from Wasco. I am not disputing the fact that Wasco probably penned a letter addressed to the member for Denry North. I am saying categorically this morning, I was never in receipt of that letter. And you cannot tell me the mystery. I still have a point of he order. He said he still have a point of order. order. So on that point, you had to say. I never received. Very well, Mr. Member for Denrena. Very well. Honorable member, honorable member, honorable minister, sorry. Minister, the honorable member, without this letter being produced to him, given the date and everything else, is disputing that he received that particular letter. Okay, he's not taking issue that the letter was written, he's taking issue that he received it personally. So just address yourself accordingly. Fair one. Okay, Mr. Speaker, he said he said he has never received that letter. He didn't pass the letters, let's say. So which means he can advise moon to pay the key power. But my lady is here already, Mr. Speaker. What's going to happen decision? Because so he have. He's not aware of the, the decision. But I will say here today, Mr. Speaker, that the was taking a decision that any individual as of April 2018 that has an arrest as far as water bill is concerned will not be paid. Alright? It will not be paid. So, which means we are forgoing $3.1 million. So, advise like I buy Mona Valley, I will pay. Now, we say Mona Valley, I will pay. Advise me. Parliamentary representative, I can miss little. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I want to say, like I said earlier, it's not a matter of planning. It's a matter of implementing. Because all of the projects, Mr. Speaker, that they plan for the past five years that they were there, how many of them were accomplished? The John Compton Dam. We heard about it all the time. All the time, Mr. Speaker, in the House of Parliament. All the time. By the members of Viewfort South. The Viewfort Redevelopment Project, Mr. Speaker, you should have it all the time. 
all the time to speak about a member for Vifort South. Un unfortunately, Honorable Aston James project, Mr. Speaker. Unfortunately, Mr. Speaker, all the time, Honorable Aston James was speaking about his project in, in, in this parliament. Nothing happening. So it doesn't happen, Mr. Speaker. It's not a matter of coming and saying, okay, I plan and I had this and I signed this contract. It's how, what have you accomplished as far as the implementation? That is the issue, Mr. Speaker. That is the issue. Implementation. And I want to say that I'm happy to be back part of a team under the leadership of Honorable Alan Shastri who are implementing, yes, implementing projects. Implementing projects. Honorable Member for Library, please, sir. Uh... <laughs> that's, that's what we are about, Mr. Speaker. That's what we are about. So, Mr. Speaker, I'm happy to be the minister responsible. I'm happy to be the minister responsible implementing this project. I'm going to show you, Mr. Speaker, if the St. Lucia Labour Party is still in power, still managing this, this country, that project would have never gotten off the ground. Based on the track record. Rosoda. Based on the track record, Mr. Speaker. So I'm happy that as one who has, was involved walking up the, the Tomaso River on many occasions, on many occasions with one Mr. Collins Lynch, a chef for Lynch at Mute Tomaso, La Reta Mazua, who work him on at least fair projet who buys Jamadia Valley Boblo. And I'm saying there to the Mr. Speaker, if the government he spoke about that stopped the project with Mr. Osbert Duvey had, had implemented it, Mr. Speaker, we would not be here today speaking of, 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 of this project, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, I want to say on behalf of the people of the Mabia Valley, and of course, on behalf of Wasco and the management of Wasco, express my appreciation to the Minister of Finance for agreeing to come to this parliament to get the approval for this loan. I thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Honorable Member for Labour. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I am pleased to join the discussion on the borrowing for the Denry North Water Project. I give unbridled support to this motion to borrow to complete the project so that the people of Denry North, who have con contributed so significantly <coughs> to national growth and development, can actually get relief in the form of safe drinking water. I want to join the member for Denry North in establishing very clearly in this honorable house that the people of Denry contributed so significantly to the socioeconomic development of St. Lucia as a whole, especially the northern part of the island. But very little, Mr. Speaker, of the contribution went into the development of Denry North. And one we look at the Denry Water Project in isolation. It's not in isolation, Mr. Speaker. The Labour Party deliberately set priorities. It was not by accident that we saw the, the construction of the De Bonnet Bridge. It was not by accident, Mr. Speaker, the Lower Grand Ravine Concrete Road. It was not by accident the Tomase, the, the, the Tomazo bridge as well as the Alba bridges were constructed. Those things were not just a product of spontaneous combustion, came like a sudden discovery, Mr. Speaker. It was because we deliberately set priorities. The Denry Water Project was in the context of health, Mr. Speaker. You know, the provision of health in any society is not just hospitals, and health centers alone. 
it is good food, safe drinking water, and a clean and wholesome environment. And so we deliberately made it a priority for us to deal with the water situation in Denrenoff. And I could say to you, Mr. Speaker, had we been in office right now, phase two would have been completed. Now, I listened to the member for Grosile as well as the member for Babuno, indicating that anything good, irrespective of the source, they will continue. When the, when the member for Denrenoff said he was a little nervous. So are, are, are they suggesting, Mr. Speaker, and I'm asking a question, that the, the St. Jude's reconstruction project was not good for the country, so they had to stop it? The library market was stopped. All the CDP projects in Palm, Black Bay, and other parts of the constituency, they were all discontinued. Are they suggesting that those projects were not good for the people of my constituency? And today, today, a government with a track record of stopping everything significant would stand up in this house and criticize the opposition for stopping things. The member for Grosile, are you suggesting, through you, are you suggesting the administrative building in Viewport was useless? Ah, and you talk about services, useless, yes? So you believe that a, 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 a horse racing track is the best thing since sliced bread? You see, Mr. Speaker, at the appropriate time, we shall debate in context those major failures. But for today, I want to conclude by indicating that this St. Lucia Labour Party whether in opposition or in government, will continue to support the development of Denrenoff as well as the rest of the constituencies in this country. And any project of value to the people of this country will be continued by the St. Lucia Labour Party. But any project which is inimical to the well-being of the people of this country, we shall get out of it. So again, I support what is good for the people of Denrenoff to get safe drinking water. And I'm pleased to have been associated with this project to negotiate the US $5 million on behalf of the country for that intervention. And I was well on, on, on my way, Mr. Speaker, in negotiating a further $5 million US million so that we can continue the project. But you see, but you see, unfortunately, unfortunately, you can laugh. You can laugh, honorable member, that's all you can do, laugh. But certainly, we are committed to the people of Denrenoff, and when we return to office, Mr. Speaker, when we return to office, whenever elections are called, we will continue the development of Denrenoff. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister for Economic Development, Housing, Urban Renewal, Transport, and Civil Aviation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'm happy to see in this Honorable House today that the members opposite are lending such unwavering support for this project and this initiative and this borrowing. Because the underlying factor that we are discussing here is the issue of borrowing. We all understand the importance of water, of safe drinking water at that. But the track records of governments in this country would tell a very good story of the development of water supplies throughout St. Lucia. And Mr. Speaker, the resolution being presented today, I recall the member for Labry, when we were discussing the first phase of this project, during the budget debate, we, the issue of the water supply came in, 
And he said that even if the project would have cost a hundred million dollars, he would have supported it. Mr. Speaker, in this honorable house, we all have a responsibility towards the total development of St. Lucia. Not selective development because it benefits my constituency, then I support it. And because I don't see a direct correlation and benefit to my locality or my area, I'm not going to support it. Now, Mr. Speaker, I don't want to go into the area of projects supported and projects not supported. When I had a member for library speak about CDP projects, he should ask me about that for the, for the five years that I spent in opposition, begging to finish a pack along the Bexon Highway. Only $35,000 was required to finish the project. And after five years, that was not done. The court that was started in Sarot for the young people, not. And I went to every length, stood in the corridors and waited. For me? Not for you. You are not in charge of CDP. That's right. <coughs> but the fact of the matter is, we are proceeding with a project because this is a project that is good not just for the people of Denry North, but it is a good project for St. Lucia. Because everybody in this country is entitled to get quality drinking water. This should not be a privilege for some people. It's a right that everybody is entitled to. And it is amazing, Mr. Speaker, that in 2018, and this is an indictment on all governments that have served in this country, that in 2018, we are still in this honorable house debating about water and who started the project and who's finishing the project. You know, some people just like to take credit for things. You know? Lack of implementation. No, our criticisms have been on the lack of implementation, not on implementation of projects. And as the, my colleague, the Honorable Member for Barmondo indicated, Hurricane Thomas was in 2010 when the dam was silted. We lost elections in 2011. And for the five years of the Labour Party, collecting the taxes for the desilting of the dam, we never saw it happen. Can you imagine if we had a major drought during that time, that it's not just Denry that would have had the problem for water? That the whole of St. Lucia would be having a problem? When it comes to projects of this nature, I had my own concerns about the decision to collect the levy on all St. Lucians, even the people of Denry who get no water from the Roseau Dam, and the people of Viewford, but everybody paid the levy. But you see, Mr. Speaker, this same government spoke about the airport and they said, oh, we're not you cannot be taxing people when you have not laid a block in the ground. Yet still they tax people on water for five years and never remove a shovel of silt from the Rosoda. That is their track record, Mr. Speaker. That is what they are good at. Talk. You sa parle, Mr. Speaker. Mais on passe à travail. Because si zet ma moun ki ka parle en chai, passe à travail en chai. So nine out of 10 times, they talk. Mr. Speaker, in my previous term in government, what, Viewfort has a major water crisis. Viewfort has a water problem that have existed. The former prime minister, three-term prime minister for Viewfort could not get one water project going in Viewfort. 
And I want them to challenge me on this. I want them to challenge me which water project. Mr. Speaker, I can tell you what had happened. <laughs> I can tell you, Mr. Speaker. There was an oh, there, there was material brought in for a treatment plan for the Grace Woodlands area because you know whenever it rains in that area, you have a problem with water. You know all the equipment that was brought was left on the ground to rot for more than ten for about ten years during the reign of the Labour Party from 1997. And you know how much money they were owing the, the consultant who had to put things together? About $250,000. That is what was owed. And instead of paying to get the project, you know when that was put back in motion, when I learned about it? When we were trying to put things back together during the drought, of 2009, 2010, which then we had Hurricane Thomas. That is when we got to know all this equipment for water treatment had been sitting on the ground for all of these years. So when it comes to project implementation, when it comes to the ability to be able to execute, Mr. Speaker, the record is clear that through the present minister responsible for WASCO, that we have not just completed phase one, but we have gone into phase two of the Mabuya Valley Water Development Project. We have now started the works on the desilting of the Rosoda. That is a government that doesn't just talk, but works. And our record is there to show. In Mikud, in Mikud South to be more precise, I remember all the years, the late Mr. James, we sat down there and we went back and forth. Always a promise. And Mr. Speaker, <coughs> records are there for people to see. The former Prime Minister in two previous budget speeches highlighted that all the money was there. It was in the budget for the Denry water supply project. In the first instance, there was about 9 million in the budget, uh, 9 or 13 million, and then it went down. And myself and the honorable member for Denry South was saying, well, last year there was that amount of money. But today, you are hearing that the honorable member for Labry had to go and negotiate here and negotiate there to find five million. But in two budget speeches, and the record is there, it's a record of this honorable house, that the money had been identified. Because talk is cheap. It's easy for people to say things. But today, the reality is, under this United Workers Party government, we are delivering on the projects that the St. Lucia Labour Party could not deliver to the people of St. Lucia. And that is why we are on this side of the house, and that's why they are over there. Because the people of St. Lucia understand, when you want work done, when you want your water project to be completed, you cannot trust the Labour Party to finish anything that was started. That's their track record. So today, we are in this honorable house and we are voting for the balance of the money to be sure that the people of Denry Valley get the water that they so rightfully deserve. That is their right. And I agree that the valley has contributed meaningfully to the growth of the economy. In the days when bananas was green gold, everybody knew what used to happen on Jeremy Street there. From the valley. Mr. Speaker, is a farmer, so I know a lot of the farmers in Denry Valley. We used to meet on the way bridge together. Yes. I used to be, I used to be down there by the way bridge, so I understand. 
These are hard working people. And it should not have taken us that long. But I am happy and I celebrate with them today that finally they will get what they deserve. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honorable Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, I think that uh, the details of this project have been well debated. Um, very much appreciative of the opposition's support for this bill. Um, I think that genuinely we know that um, the people from Denry are going to truly benefit from, from this project. There's a, a worrying trend though, Mr. Speaker, I have to say, and I've given it a tremendous amount of reflection over the time. Um, in, in private moments when I meet with people, um, I take a fair amount of criticism from them, um, specifically in, in not being specific enough about some of the things we're doing. And in particular, um, not responding to the opposition. You know, my motto certainly has been to focus my energy and the energy of my government on actually executing programs. Let the work speak. You know, but I have, I have to, Mr. Speaker, really bring up a point. And, and that point is, is that when I go through my constituency and I have the opportunity to meet with the people in Angers and in T. Rocher, I have lots of time for that. And I meet with them. And they talk about the amount of years that one day you have water, another day you don't have water. All right? And I'm just so glad that the member from Denry North was able to articulate how important water is to a community. From a health perspective, the Minister of Social Development talked about that sometimes water is that forgotten element in the quality of life of people. And I know your people in Dearborn were very appreciative when the minister was able to bring Laborn, when they were able to bring water to them. But we can't speak on both sides of our mouth. If we're recognizing that it's good for one community, it's, it's good for everybody. And, and specifically, that when we talk about victimization, and, and this is a message for both of us, both sides of the house, that when we believe that we're scoring political points or doing things in which uh, for political expedience may seem right on the surface, in all times, it's the people that pay the price. There's never an exception to that. It's always about the people. And ultimately, it's also about the country. So the fact is, is that when you can stand up and make a claim that you're grateful that the project and talk about projects that have been stopped, but on the same time that when you were in government, because that's really where it matters. Where it matters is when you're in government. Yes, we're there now. And that's why we're continuing the project. Okay, we are doing it. And the fact is, is that you can't stand up and make that claim when you had an opportunity in cabinet, Mr. Speaker. He had an opportunity in cabinet. That understanding, because I can feel it that it's genuine that he understood what the people in Denry North were going through. That he genuinely understood that. And how is it that in understanding that, that a neighboring constituency, you don't have to even go that far, was deprived of water. Miku North, Miku South, Miku South in particular. So yes, it is about evaluating all the projects, regardless of which constituency they're in. I'm sure that when the Minister of Infrastructure was talking about fixing up the roads in Olion, he didn't consider whether in fact that that was an opposition. It's the same people in St. Lucia who stood to benefit. It's about creating infrastructure in order to facilitate the growth of this country. And I am proud of the work that we're doing. 
I'm proud of the fact that I'm with a group of men and women who look past just politics and talk about country and are mindful every single time. <coughs> mindful every single time. Unlike the opposition I have to see, Mr. Speaker, who continuously make public statements and assessments in order to benefit themselves. And this is a classic example where a person would stand up on the other side, Mr. Speaker, and speak with genuine emotion about the need of water, but so quickly forget that when he was in government, he did nothing to be able to make sure that everybody in St. Lucia was benefiting from that water. So I'm very proud of the fact that we're able to continue the project. I'm proud of the fact, Mr. Speaker, that the second phase is taking place, and I'm very proud of the fact that the minister and, the, and WASCO saw fit to renegotiate the loan in order to be able to lower some of the expenses, in order to be able to make sure that this thing was being done effectively. And I'm also extremely proud of the fact, and it should not go unnoticed, that our continual confidence in the ability of solution contractors and consultants to be able to do the job, and that we're going to continuously support them on all occasions. So again, Mr. Speaker, I thank you um, for this opportunity. Honourable Members, the question is that Parliament authorizes the Minister for Finance to amend the loan agreement and to borrow from the Caribbean Development Bank an amount not exceeding U.S. of July and the first day of October of each year, commencing on the first due date after the expiration of five years following the date of the amending loan agreement or on such later due date as the Caribbean Development Bank specifies in writing. B. Is payable in, at an interest rate of 4.5% per annum or at such other rate that the Caribbean Development Bank specifies to take effect after the first due date after the 41st day of March or the 40th day of September in, in a year withdrawn and outstanding on the amount of the ordinary capital resources portion. And C is subject to a commitment charge at a rate of 1% per annum, payable quarterly on the amount of the ordinary capital resources portion on withdrawn and which accrues from the 60th day following the date of the amending loan agreement. I now put the question. As many as are of that opinion, say aye. aye. As many as of a contrary opinion, say no. I think the eyes of it. The eyes of it. Honorable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move the following motion standing in my name. And be it resolved that the Parliament authorizes the Minister of Finance to borrow by means of advances the sums not exceeding $55 million from commercial banks for a period of six months from the date hereof, which sum shall be charged on and paid out of the consolidated fund. This resolution seeks Parliament approval for the Government of St. Lucia to borrow by means of advances to facilitate the renewal of overdraft facilities at the commercial banks. Um, Section 38.1 of the Finance Administration Act, Chapter 1501, authorizes the Minister of Finance by a resolution of Parliament to borrow money from a bank or other financial institution by means of advances to an amount not exceeding in the aggregate the sum specified for the purpose of the re resolution to meet current requirements such as 
resolution, uh, such, uh, and such resolution shall not have effect for any period exceeding six months. So this is a, a facility, Mr. Speaker, that uh, in essence is an overdraft facility for government's operations and requires, in order for it to be effective, its renewal on every six month period. Parliament Res Resolution Number 16 of 2018 authorized the Minister for Finance to borrow sums not exceeding $55 million, outstanding at any one time by means of fluctuating overdraft with commercial banks. The overdraft facilities held at the various commercial banks are used to facilitate the timely settlement of government salaries and other operating expenses when necessary. It, is not become, it has not become necessary to do so. The last time the facility was used was in July of 2018. In order that the government may be authorized to access short-term borrowing to meet current requirements, it has become necessary to obtain parliamentary approval through a new resolution. Given the current requirements and the short-term forecast of government's operating expenditure, including monthly salaries and the anticipated usage of the overdraft facility, the Ministry of Finance is of the view that the 55 million limit is adequate. Accordingly, the Ministry proposes the following overdraft limits at the various commercial banks. At the Royal Bank of Trinidad and Tobago, $2.2 million. At the Royal Bank of Canada, $2.8 million. First Caribbean International Bank, $4 million. The Bank of Nova Scotia, $6 million. First National Bank of St. Lucia, $2.5 million. Bank of St. Lucia, $37.5 million, which would be the total of the $55 million. The overdraft facility is expected to generate an average interest cost for the financial year of approximately a half a million dollars, which represents a cost of less than 1% of the facility. Overdraft borrowing by the government attracts interest ranging from 10% to 11.5% per annum at various commercial banks. However, with the advent of the regional government securities market, government has been able to borrow short-term funds by issuing treasury bills. Government of St. Lucia treasury bills have been able to attract interest rates as low as 2.99% on the RGSM platform. The raising of funds on the RGSM is not a complete substitute for the use of overdraft facility. However, funds obtained from the RGSM plus the overdraft facility should be used in tandem, resulting in an effective management of cash flows and a reduction in short-term interest cost. The facility is due to the renewal is due for renewal as is customary. So again, uh, Mr. Speaker, I think that their good news is that uh, the financial burdens that we've once seen have been abated and that we are clearly operating within the confines as legislated. And I seek Parliament's approval to be able to facilitate and renew this overdraft facility for another period of six months. I thank you. Honourable Members, the question is that Parliament authorizes the Minister for Finance to borrow by means of advances sums not exceeding $55 million from commercial banks for a period of six months from the date hereof, which sums shall be charged on and paid out of the consolidated fund. I now put a question. As many as of that opinion say I. As many as our country opinions, you know, I think the eyes have it. The eyes have it. Honorable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move the following motion standing in my name. Be it resolved that Parliament authorizes the Attorney General to make the revised edition of the laws of 2014 supplement to the revised edition of the laws commencement amendment order to offer the sale to the public the revised edition of the laws in the form of loose leaf, CD-ROM, or other forms of electronic sh storage and pages at the price set out in the order. Mr. Speaker, these are the laws that we have, and, and this is the document that the, the 
company that provides all these laws for us. And in, in addition to being in hard copy, they've also provided into CD-ROM. And simply what we're seeking is permission for the Attorney General's office um, to be able to order um, these items in order to have them stocked to be on sold to the different business houses and also to the, the legal entities. This is not expected um, to cost um, the government any money as the cost that's being charged is equivalent to the cost that we're paying um, for um, these items. So again, I seek uh, Parliament's approval in order to authorize the Attorney General to proceed on what is a customary um, uh, item. Honourable members, the question is that Parliament authorizes the Attorney General to make the revised edition of the Laws 2014 Supplement to the revised edition of the Laws Commencement Amendment Order to offer for sale to the public the revised edition of the Laws in the form of loose leaf, CD-RAM, or other forms of electronic storage and pages at the price set out in the order. I now put a question, as many as are of that opinion, see I, Aye. as many as our contrary opinion, see no, I think the eyes have it, the eyes have it. Honorable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move the following motion standing in my name. Um, be it resolved that Parliament authorizes the Minister responsible for finance to borrow U.S. $2 million by way of a loan from an international development association to finance the organization of Eastern Caribbean states' micro, small, and medium-sized enterprise guarantee facility project. Be it further resolved that the maximum uh, commitment charge rate payable on the unwithdrawn finance balance is one-half of 1% 1 per annum. And B, a service charge is payable on the withdrawn credit balance that is equal to the greater of one, the sum of the three-fourths of per, of one percent per annum, plus the basis adjustment, and two, three-fourths of one percent per annum. The principal amount of the loan is repayable on each 15th day of June and 15th day of December. Commencing, commencing on the 15th day of December 2028 to, to and including the 15th day of June 2038 at the rate of 1%. Commencing on the 15th of December 2038 to and including the 15th day of June 2058 at the rate of 2%. So, so Mr. Speaker, the request to Parliament approval to borrow $2 million loan fund from the International Development Association, IDA, to finance the organization of Eastern Caribbean Partial Credit Guarantee Corporation. So the background to this program, Mr. Speaker, is that micro and small and medium-sized enterprises are a significant source of jobs and economic activity to the Caribbean region. The government and the organization of the Eastern Caribbean states, along with the World Bank, have decided to establish the Eastern Caribbean Partial Credit Guarantee Corporation to increase the facilitation um, credit to business owners for growth and expansion. The OECS economies have grappled with the challenges of low growth, high debt, fiscal deficits, financial sector weaknesses, and vulnerabilities to the external shocks. This has led to an acute credit crunch to the medium-sized businesses. As financial institutions increasing reduce their, as financial institutions increasing reduce their exposure to sectors that are critical for economic growth. This is especially due to the high non-performing loans on their balance sheets. A partial guarantee scheme was agreed to be the preferred instrument to address the elevated credit risk that would result in MSNMEs getting credit and at the same time mitigate the risk faced by financial institutions. On March 2nd, 2017, the Monetary Council of the Eastern Caribbean Union approved and signed the agreement for the establishment of the ECPCGC. The ECPCGC will provide partial guarantees on loans made by financial institutions, commercial banks, development banks, and credit unions 
to SME borrowers located in OECS member countries. So in essence, Mr. Speaker, here's how it's going to work. Owners of MSMEs, small businesses, will apply to their local lender for a loan. If the lender is not able to approve the application using its conventional credit standards, it may decide to request a guarantee. So business person goes in, applies for loan. If the bank believes there is not enough security to justify giving the loan, he now can turn to the guarantee. That is, the bank turns to the guarantee, not the small business person. The ECBTC will review the application and determine if the guarantee is appropriate. The target customer is business owners who have adequate cash flow to make loan payments but may not have adequate asset to pledge as collateral. So Mr. Speaker, we know many people like that. Um, young people, people who've been working for somebody for many years and now want to open up their own business and who may not have the asset base to do so but have a great idea. And in the estimation of the local bank, can provide a positive cash flow. But the bank is restricted because it would need to have some level of collateral to be able to approve the loan. So what this facility does, it allows the bank on those cases to be able to get a guarantee from this regional organization in order to be able to execute the loan so that they're in compliance with their own um, uh, uh, laws. At present, more risk than usual is in one area of business that is relatively new for the lender, such as creative industries or medical services. Maximum guarantee percentage offered will be 80% on loans that may not exceed $300,000. So it means that the regional entity will guarantee up until 80% of what the loan amount is. But the total loan amount cannot exceed $300,000. The official name, ECPCGC, was established by an agreement signed by seven member governments. It is a statutory corporation that has a full legal personality and has all the rights, privileges, and immunities contained in its legislation. The legislation is also include the composition of appointment of persons to the board of directors. The ECPCGC will provide the guarantee on loans to small businesses in return for a fee. The fee income and the earnings generated by investing the capital base will provide sufficient revenue that will be used to pay loan losses and operating expenses. So it means the monies that we're putting in, so St. Lucia is putting in $2 million, plus the fees that it's going to earn will be continuously reinvested in order to make sure that we can replenish the account. The ECPCGC will run with a minimum staff who will have significant expertise and be responsible for a range of duties within the areas of expertise. The ECPCGC will be overseen by a board of directors consisting of nine members, one from each participating country, the ECCU Bankers Association, and two members representing micro, small, and medium-sized businesses. This would represent a chamber of commerce from two participating member countries by alphabetical rotation. The ECPCGC interaction with lenders will run electronically. Applications processed through a web portal designed for guarantee lending. So how is it going to get started? As per Article 72 of the ECPCGC, the government of St. Lucia ratified the agreement on May 7, 2018. The Monetary Council will, as per the agreement, assist in establishing the scheme, vet the nominees for the Board of Directors, appoint by majority vote, <coughs> provide initial policy guidance during the first year of operation. The ECCB will assist in the selection of four initial staff members of the ECPCGC. The guarantee scheme. The total project cost for the ECPCGC is US 12 million, of which St. Lucia is putting in 2 million. To facilitate the implementation, the World Bank has approved loan funding from IDA Resources to support the implementation for Dominica, Grenada, St. Lucia, and St. Vincent and the Grenadines. The reason why <coughs> other countries aren't getting that is because they are not members of IDA. 
Antigua and Barbuda will be receiving the loan support, support from IBRD resources, while St. Kitts and Nevis will be providing counterpart funding as co-financing of its share to the initial authorized capital. Each of the participating country share is US $2 million. The project has two components, and with respect to the national contribution, the US $2 million will be applied as follows. Capitalization of the CGF under part one of the project, the amount of the credit would be $1.6 million. Two, goods, works, non-consulting services, consulting services, training and operating costs for part two of the project will be $380,000. That is how our funds are going to be used in moving forward. The terms of the loan, US $2 million, or equivalent of SDR $1.4 million, calculated on the basis of the exchange rate of US dollars, 1.4 million, 380,006 uh, dollars to SDR one as of April 30th, 2018. A commitment fee, the maximum commitment charge rate payable by the recipient on the unwithdrawn financing balance shall be one half of 1% per annum. The service charge payable by the recipient on the withdrawn credit balance shall be the, the, the greater of 0.75% per annum plus the basis adjustment to the service charge fixed under the date of the board of approval and 0.75% per annum calculated on the disbursed and outstanding balance of IDA credit. Repayment maturity, the credit will be payable in 40 years, maturity including 10 years of grace period. Repayment dates, the agreed principal repayment dates are on each June 15th and December 15th of 1% per annum from year 11 to 20 and 2% per annum from year 21 to year 40. So Mr. Speaker, we really believe that the implementation of this project is incredibly timely. The Caribbean, unfortunately, has still not recovered and its banks have recovered from the financial crisis in 2008 and 2009. And the, the group of people that probably have felt this the most have been small businesses. And a lot of young people, a lot of people who have put a lot of years of hard work working for someone who now want an opportunity to do their own business, have to no fault of anyone been denied that opportunity. And while this is 12 million US dollars, and it probably does not adequately reflect the demand that's out there. I believe that this is a good beginning, Mr. Mr. Speaker. And I, I'm really hoping that young people in St. Lucia, elderly people in St. Lucia, who want to be able to open up their own businesses, have a great idea, have been going around trying to get somebody to help fund, will be able to access this facility. And I'm really hoping that we can grow this entity. And I really want to thank the World Bank. And in particular, I want to thank um, uh, Governor Antoine um, from the Central Bank um, for his passion and his energy in helping this uh, be facilitated. So again, I'm hoping that we can get the support of Parliament in approving this loan facility, specifically to be able to help uh, the future entrepreneurs and leaders of our country. Honourable members, the question is that Parliament authorizes the Minister responsible for finance to borrow US $2 million by way of a loan from the International Development Association to finance the organization of Eastern Caribbean states' micro, small, and medium-sized enterprise guarantee facility project. Be it further resolved that A, the maximum commitment charge rate payable on the unwithdrawn financing balance is one-half of 1% 1 per annum. B, a service charge is payable on the unwithdrawn credit balance that is equal to the greater part of one, the sum of three fourths of one percent per annum plus the basis adjustment, two, three fourths of one percent per annum, c, the principal amount of the loan is repayable on each 15th day of June and 15th day of December, one, commencing on the 15th day of December 2028, 20, two, and including the 15th day of June 2038 at a rate of 1%, and two, commencing on the 15th day of December 2038, two, and including the 15th day of June 2058 at a rate of 2%. <laughs>
0.2%. Member for Viewfort South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, there are two points that I want to address very quickly. <clears throat> One is procedural. Um, the, the second has to do with issues of accountability um, <clears throat> for projects of, of this kind. Mr. Speaker, I have to credit you with far greater wisdom than I can conceivably have in procedural matters before the, the House. Um, I mean, that's your area of expertise, and I'm sure you're familiar with all the rules. But I noticed today that the <clears throat> member for Miku North in presenting the South, the South. Miku South in presenting the, the various resolutions tend to read the <clears throat> section of the motion that deals with the final resolution itself and not the entire motion. Now, I'm not making an issue of this. It, you are uh, the speaker. You give the guidance. Suffice it to say, however, that the motions are supposed to be read into the record of the House um, for all kinds of reasons. All kinds of reasons. So what should happen is that the entire motion, especially because of financial motion, has to be read so that it enters Hansard fully for future references of one kind or another. Because the preambular clauses do have essential information that is critical and crucial and may not be always reflected in the final paragraph. But that's a matter for you, and I am just <coughs> um, drawing your attention to this, and hope perhaps during your lunch break you can check the appropriate procedural records to determine whether that is correct. And it is not by any means, by any stretch of the imagination, a criticism, just an anxiety that the historical record is probably accounted for. Mr. Speaker, <clears throat> there can be little question that a motion of this type should draw the approval of the collective opposition today. And there's no doubt that funding of this kind is badly needed for the small business sector. However, I have an issue, an is issue of accountability. What we heard from the Prime Minister was, uh, and the Minister of Finance was a rather elaborate machinery to create disagreement and uh, to disburse the, the, the funds. And it is interesting that the disbursement of those funds have been removed from the governments and entrusted to a regional mechanism. That's my, my first point and first issue of, of concern. And from time to time, we have seen over the passage of time in this house and elsewhere that we come to the house to secure guarantees for regional funds to be used regionally but what has really been sorely lacking has been reports from those regional entities as to how they have used those funds. The House is never informed. Neither do you have any idea, for example, when they are charged with using those funds and they go into your various constituencies to do all kind of work. You have no idea what they are doing in there and they don't even engage parliamentarians so that you have a sense that money you came to the House to approve that it is being used for the purposes that were intended. Now, of course, I'm not casting any aspersions. I am simply saying that there is a deeper problem of accountability in these matters, that whenever these funds are entrusted to these regional mechanisms, that we do not, in turn, get the reports. They're not made available to the parliaments. I would love if it is agreed that a report is submitted to the Parliament of St. Lucia regarding the use of those funds and how those funds have actually impacted on the small business sector. So that's the first thing. The second thing I take issue with is the involvement of the Monetary Council. If I heard the Prime Minister correctly, if I heard the member from Miko South, he made reference to the Monetary Council 
appointing individuals or recommending individuals. This issue really requires some discussion. The Monetary Council should stop getting involved in such matters. That's not a fiscal matter. It's not a monetary matter. The business of the Monetary Council is to handle monetary issues. This constant habit of the Monetary Council to get involved in the administration of matters far removed from monetary issues has to be curtailed and brought to an end. The Monetary Council should spend more time looking at the challenges that the citizens of the Eastern Caribbean face over banking issues. Day by day, St. Lucians have been abused by the banking sector. How many St. Lucians who have checking accounts in banks can't get their checks cashed unless they go to the bank themselves? These are kinds of issues that the Monetary Council should be addressing to protect St. Lucian consumers against banking practices. Nobody is speaking for them. And for years, we have been arguing with the Monetary Council that they have to change their approach. And it's not a question of making statements about economic performance of these islands. It's not just a question of regulating banks to now the very complex legal arrangements. But it is also a question of looking at the issues confronting day-to-day -day consumers with the banking sector. Now, what are you getting involved in a matter like small business loans by appointing people or getting involved in the administration on such a matter? I don't care about the governor's passion for small business. So his passion cannot and should not translate into getting involved in the administration of a, such, a, such a, a financial arrangement. There's no need for it. So, Mr. Speaker, there are two points in summary. One, I hope we can get reports because we are guaranteeing and we deserve reports on how this is impacting the small business sector, who are getting the loans, who are making the differences. That's number one. And number two, I think this Monetary Council should be told in clear, in clear terms that this is not a monetary matter and it should not get involved in matters of this kind. Pay more attention to the hardship that ordinary consumers are enduring from the banks in St. Lucia and indeed in the region as a whole. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. On your member for Castries now. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I rise in support of the motion, which I believe is one that is welcomed, not just by those of us on this side, but by the many who will benefit from such a facility though regional, available here in St. Lucia. While I must commend the effort and the fact that it provides that avenue necessary, particularly for our young entrepreneurs to get into small business and to make their contribution to the economy of the country, I'm concerned and I hope that as a government we will be able to help in the formulation of what I believe is a necessary element in providing finances to small business people or business people generally. For me, my concern is that invariably people get into business either because they've got an idea, they have some knowledge, or they've got money. But one critical element in most instances that is lacking is financial management or business management, or even the provision of guidance and counseling to those individuals going into business. Because it doesn't mean 
that because you have an idea or you have the knowledge of a particular kind of business that you can run a business what is most important is your knowledge your ability your discipline and the understanding of business that will make you successful if you do not understand the environment you're likely to fail if you cannot manage money you're likely to fail and many times we see businesses emerging on the horizon and soon or later failure to be able to do the necessary study the diagnosis of the situation to do the research to determine whether the choice of business is one that is likely to survive or there's an appetite many times that kind of research is not done and individuals without the capacity get into the system and fail. So for me, I would hope that from our end, that we'll be able to put in place on two levels. One, at the education system, a guidance and counseling program that can get students to understand business and to give them the necessary training. But in the, in the private sector, to ensure that those persons will be accessing those loans, not only prepare a good business plan, but also to give them that hand, give them the guidance, give them the counseling, and give them the training to guarantee that the, the rate of failure is kept at a bare minimum. Because the problem we have in the banking system, the problem we have in the banking system is that many times, many times, it's as a consequence of bad judgment. It is as a result of individuals not having the necessary training and understanding to, to get involved in business. So that is my concern about this. That is one of the things I believe. You take the Bell Fund at one time. The Bell Fund was an excellent initiative. But what has happened over the, over the years, it still exists. But I'm sure if you were to look at the records of the Bell Fund and look at the rate of, of failure, when you compare success and failure, you'd find a number of those individuals, although the intention was to provide that kind of counseling and guidance, a number of those persons are failing. That in itself influences the business, the, the banking system in as far as the restrictions and the, the, the rules and regulations and the policies that they adopt, which makes it even more difficult for those young men and women who want to go into business. But more than that, I also believe that there must be an element in the system for young persons who may have an idea, who may not qualify to get the necessary resources to start that business, but can sell the idea one way or the other, or make the idea, or market the idea, through, of course, the, um, not trademark, but um, intellectual properties. So through the intellectual properties, to be able to use that intellectual property as a means of generating revenue. So I think this is a, a wonderful idea. I endorse it 100%, but I'm hoping that in the architecture of what we are putting together to administer those loans that we can take into consideration the need to prepare our young people to access those funds. Because many times, individuals who get into business believe that the day's sale goes into their pocket. It's similar to those persons who say, I want a contract. And you give them a contract for $100,000. And they believe out of that $100,000, $70,000 is theirs. And don't even understand what it takes to manage the contract to be able to emerge with a reasonable profit that can take them along. So it's a misconception. It's a misconception of business. What does business bring about? Most businesses around really and truly, in terms of their profit margins, are very narrow. Most contracts for example, 
probably the profit margin is about 30%. Some are even less. So imagine you have a contract of $100,000. And you believe, wow, I've got a $100,000 contract. And then you return and say, well, minister, I didn't make any money. I only made $5,000. You have mismanaged it. But it is a question of discipline. Discipline, 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 and being able to be trained to understand what you're getting into and to be prepared to administer your operations in a manner that will guarantee the necessary success. I thank you. Honorable Member for Castro Central. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, I rise to support the motion presented by the Honorable Prime Minister and to say that this facility that will provide much needed support and encouragement to small businesses and of course the resources that may be required to help small businesses get started or to help small businesses expand, to help ideas grow. I see it as a beacon of hope, certainly for my constituents. When I go to my constituency office, Mr. Speaker, as I've said here before, I believe, if I see 40 people, 90 to 95% come because of unemployment or unemployment related matters. So while the person may not come seeking for a job, the person might come to say, I can't pay my rent, or I can't pay my medical bills, or I can't pay my child's school fees. So we're talking about unemployment or underemployment where persons just do not have the income to meet their daily needs. But you see a lot of these, these persons, Mr. Speaker, who have great ideas, who are running small businesses which have potential to grow, who have cash flow, who have clients. I can think of a constituent of mine who runs a food business. He's passionate about cooking. I mean, you hear him talk about going to chop his seasonings at night and preparing, and he probably has 50, 60, 70 customers in the city. He knows that when he prepares his meals, every single meal will sell. And if he's not feeling well, he can't afford not to cook because his customers will call him. They will not have lunch. I can think of a constituent of mine exactly in this situation who might perhaps be someone who can benefit from this initiative because whereas he goes to town carrying this big box of lunches, you can hardly see his face when he's carrying it. A man like that probably needs a nice little cart that he can wheel with a nice logo on it. Maybe it can be refrigerated. He can carry his salads and what have you. And he can take a step forward to improve his business. But where does someone like this go in the current situation where we do not have enough opportunities to support small businesses? First thing, I mean, he might think, well, I really want to expand my business, but he's daunted just by the thought of going to a bank where the first thing he'll be asked is, well, what collateral do you have? Or do you have someone to sign for you? Nowadays, people don't even sign loans or guarantee loans for people anymore because it's just so risky. I mean, I, as I said, I can think of one person, but there are many other persons who come with great ideas. And sometimes, I shouldn't say sometimes, so very often, even when we just speak about small business, a lot of dreams die even before they reach incubation because people are just daunted and frightened, thinking that I have a great idea, but I just can't start it. It's too daunting. There is just not an environment, an atmosphere where I feel my idea will grow. 
And I think that is what we need to communicate to people who have ideas, particularly young people or people who are struggling in business. That some of the greatest corporations started in a garage, in the boot of a car. But somebody had an idea. They believed in the idea. They got assistance to move on with that. They persisted. They were tenacious in it. And they got help where they needed, one step at a time. I think this is what we have to bring home. This is what we have to communicate, particularly to young people who are struggling, who have great business ideas. We must give them the hope they need to know it is possible and that there is an avenue for support. And that is what I particularly would like to communicate to my constituents today and, of course, to the people of St. Lucia. We started a program called Synergy in Castry Central, as you know, which is a pilot project. And to date, we have created eight programs that offer opportunities for training and to support small business. And the way we intend to do it is to partner with agencies that are already doing great work in training and providing support and coaching for small business. And this is what I am hoping that this facility will also do. Because the Honorable Member for Cashfree's North mentioned Belfont. We have SEDU. We have the German Savings Bank that has just started some training, I think, through the First National Corporation. All of these agencies and others are there. Training is available, coaching is available, but the people need to know that it is available. And they need to know that once they set foot out walking, they will not be abandoned. They will get the support. What I also think, Mr. Speaker, is that sometimes we feel it's just the business coaching that people need. But sometimes people need social support to get it done. So other, other agencies such as, like, as Human Services, community, community Development can come in. You have a woman who's a great business person, but she may be facing a domestic violence situation at home, which affects her ability to manage her business. Great business idea. She may have gotten the cash, she may have gotten the business training, but she has a social situation that is impacting and she may fail in the business or may suffer losses because of a domestic situation. I'm just giving an example. A child who, need extra, who needs extra care and that takes away or it diminishes the quality of time or the quantity of time she can put in her business, which otherwise would, would be a great business idea. So what I'm uh, suggesting, Mr. Speaker, this is such an excellent idea and I commend the government for it, but there has to be collaboration between all agencies and I note in the project doc document that it indicates that there needs to be education training because if this is to be what it is meant to be, if we are to achieve this in letter and spirit, there must be a, a holistic approach and a commitment to seeing small businesses work. So it's not just a question of providing the loan that's guaranteed. It's a question of doing everything that is necessary, bringing all agencies together to ensure that the support and coaching that is required is afforded, not just at the outset, but for the long run, for as long as it is available. And these agencies already exist, Mr. Speaker. It's a question of making sure that everybody comes together to make this work. Most times when people think of a business, the first place they go is to the loans officer. Persons may not go to Belfond. And people sometimes feel intimidated before they start. You say in your mind, I will not qualify. You say the whole world is against me. I've failed at this. I've failed at that. I've tried this. I've tried that. I would like to encourage young people today, or people who want to embark on business, not because you failed at one, it means that you're a failure. You use your failure to assess 
the path that you trod on and what things you can do differently. Your failure, quote unquote, can become a success because you have learned along the way and you take that and you move with it. This complements other programs that the government is doing. For example, you will recall that we received from the Chilean government a grant of 100,000 US dollars to start an entrepreneurial fund for women in difficult circumstances. This matter has now gone through cabinet and it should be launched uh, sometime in November, certainly before the end of the year. And we've had many women already calling and saying, I've got an idea, how can I get assistance? Also, of course, we need to cater for men, for the young men, and that is something that, that um, my ministry is seeing how we can get support and assistance to have uh, that kind of program. But this here is for everybody, but what is important is that, for example, the loan officers, I note that they're supposed to receive training. The agreement provides that training is very, very important to be done, because loan officers at banks, need to understand what this facility is about, not just in the letter, but in the spirit. Because sometimes you go to a loan officer and depending on what you told, and you think that's the end of my day, it can't go anywhere. But training, constant training and retraining, even when there are staff turnovers at the bank to ensure that loan officers understand why this facility is being put there so that persons are encouraged and persons who qualify are referred accordingly. Training for the persons who are presenting the business idea so that they can present it confidently, that they can explain exactly what it is they are trying to achieve so that they can have the best opportunity should they qualify to get assistance. Mr. Speaker, I am very excited about this. I will say that for Castry Central, we will read through this very carefully in terms of the procedure, the means by which people qualify, and we will have a seminar in our constituency so that we can bring the various agencies together, so that we can break it down for, for our people, so that they can understand exactly what this facility offers and how they can qualify for it. We will not break the back of unemployment unless we come up with creative ideas such as this, but we must, we must make sure that if there are a hundred things to be done to make it work, we don't do 99, because it's the one that we miss that might result in this not generating the kind of success and results that we want to see. I said before, Mr. Speaker, in times that I spoke that my priority in Castry Central this year is jobs. And I certainly, as a member of parliament, would like to be able to come here to say at some point that when I stood and supported this resolution, I was thinking of Pepe in my constituency, or I was thinking of John in my constituency, and I want to see how I'm going to bring this down and ensure that I can refer my constituents to this facility and that other agencies will be brought into support so that we can break the back of unemployment. That is how we stimulate the economy, and that is how we help our people enjoy the quality of life that they deserve. This is the structure, but we all have to work to make it happen. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honorable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I beg that we uh, suspend the House for lunch, and we can come back at uh, quarter to three. One hour. On your members, the question is that this house st stands suspended until quarter to three. I now put a question as many as are of that opinion say I. As many as are of a contrary opinion say no. I think the eyes have it. The eyes have it. The house is suspended.